Hey guys, how's it going? It's Cameron Barkey here with the Thought Exchange. I got my co-host right here. What's going on? Steve Van Deest. We got uh, Matt Phillips in the house right now. Hey, what's going on? And uh, we were just talking about Skip the Dishes and Fedora. Yeah. And we're talking about the whole thing here. Uh, uh, we'll have Matt Phillips um, kind of talk about himself a little bit, what he's doing, what he's up to. But uh, basically the guy runs and kills and owns one of the dopest chicken places in the city. Yeah. I can't even, I can't even, I think that's an understatement. Yeah. I love his place. Like I, I freaking, I tell people this all the time, Matt Phillips, that I had, he, he's selling 40s there. I had the first 40. I bought the first 40 from his restaurant and I drank it out of a paper bag. No. Yeah. Dude, the guy's got, it was, uh, when it was Colt, when Colt 45. It was Colt 45. <laughs> yeah. It's been out of stock in Alberta for just about three months. We haven't had any since the beginning of January. Serious. The minute it comes back into stock, we're putting it back on the menu. Dude, you got to text me and be like, yo, bro, come get a Colt. Like, uh, it's crazy how many Colts we sold. You like, sold a lot? Yeah. It sold like a case and a half a week. I think that's hilarious. Like 18 a week, 20 a week. <laughs> we're the best beer list. We just got ranked the number three beer list in Alberta, and we still were selling 18 Colts a week. I think that probably would have helped. Yeah. Yeah, because that's hilarious. Like, who's selling Colt 45s? <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to do old E, but it's a bigger size, so HLC had issues with how many of them can be on a table and that kind of stuff. Are you because serious? It's over a liter. There's some care and control stuff there on how many drinks you're allowed to have on a table. And oh. when that could go out around last call, and rather than dealing with it, we just put Colt on. You just pulled Colt. Yeah. yeah, Colt's still Because that's still ad. just two beer. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that doesn't make sense. How can you have a bottle of wine on a table and not a uh, Because a bottle of wine 750. So it'd be like having a Magnum on the table. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. you can't do that. No, you, you can't point, have a magnum. I like you can this. have a magnum. You just can't have a magnum after one o'clock oh. or before last call. You need oh. to be controlling how much alcohol is on the table, that kind of stuff. So it was yeah. just easier for us to just stick with the below one liter product and don't even have that. to worry about that. Yeah. Plus, yeah. Colt's cold. Like yeah, Colt's sick. Well, these awesome, but I'd rather drink Colt. Yeah, Colt's sick, yo. I kind of want one tonight. I'm not. Oh, I can't. They're out. Now they're gone? Like I don't, I don't know if some crazy liquor stores have them, but you can't buy them straight from Connect anymore. Oh, okay, yeah. There's probably um, some st still on shelves somewhere. I'm sure. Alberta has the cold 45 shortage. <laughs> Yo. Oh, because Matt Ferguson. Do you remember, uh, what was it? It was when El Cortez was like super popping off. I don't know if you remember this, but they had uh, their coconut tequila, and they would sell out of that like everywhere. They, so they bought all the coconut tequila in the city. I don't know if you're a tequila guy. Yeah. Coconut tequila is kind of random, but you'd go like to any liquor store. Hey, do you guys got that coconut tequila? And they'd be like, no, uh, actually the guys from El Cortez came here and bought like eight bottles from us because they ran out. It was like everybody was Fernet. Or when uh, Bud Light Lime first came yeah. out, man, those yeah. were fucking Oh yeah, Bud Light Lime I used to go buy that by the pallet when I worked at Joey's. Yeah. And I was in the kitchen and me and the GM would just fly to whatever liquor store and like buy whatever <laughs> we could get because we were selling so much of it. Yeah, what uh, what was with the Bud Light Lime craze? That was that went crazy. That stuff was so bad. It was good. It was so good. It was really, really good. But And then they came out with the cans. The cans didn't taste the same. Not as much as the, as the glass bottle. It was, just, it was so good. Dudes, dudes would make fun of other because guys make fun of dudes who drink like girly drinks. Hey, that's the thing. Like, yeah. like they'll be like, "Hey man, like, how's your uh, how's your cosmopolitan doing? Like, you little puff. Like they say stuff. You know, like dudes have yeah. that stigma around them. But that stigma was kind of around with Bud Light Lime. But we all drank it, so we all didn't really talk about it. We're like, "Yo, this shit's kind of good." But no one would actually crush like five liters. Of time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that shit was hilarious, man. That was uh. Yeah, definite, definite different times with that thing. So, restaurant's doing good? Yeah, restaurant's awesome. Yeah. Good job, boys. Just had one of the best weeks we've ever had, and just rolling along, cooking chicken, slanging beer. Yeah. Try to get some people into some bourbon. So. How long have you been in that spot for? Uh, two and a half, just about two and a half years. November 4th, 2016, we opened. Yeah, what was in there before? Was it a burger spot? Or yeah, there was, was a burger joint in there called Relish. Relish, lasted yeah, like Relish. lasted seven months-ish. Yeah. And then before that, it was a burger joint called Bannock Burger. Bannock Burger. Yeah. And they were doing like... Uh, they were doing like Bannock and patties. Yeah. It didn't last very long at all. And then it was a bar called Hooligans for a few years. Hooligans. Hooligans, I yeah. think I remember that name. Like a karaoke, karaoke kind of bar. Reminds me of that show. Shenanig Shenanigans? Yeah. <laughs> Shenanigans, that was a funny one too. The shenanigans up by my place. Is there? In Clairview. Yeah, the old, yeah shenanigans. The old chrome. Yeah, you oh, remember, geez, you remember chrome that? Chrome Ultra Lounge. Remember chrome movie? Ultra Lounge became <laughs> shenanigans. That's, uh, where is that one? Uh, Victoria Trail on like 120th. 
Oh yeah. Like it's how right many? By my house. How many people got shot at that? But chrome? That place. <laughs> that chrome was insane. I performed there a few times, and it really? was like I was like, oh, this is scary. There's another place where I was. What was it called? Oh, I forget what it was called. Northside 118th Ave in like by the Greyhound bus depot. Anyways, it was like on par with Chrome and I was like I walk in there and I was like, uh, am I am supposed to be here? Like it was like it was it was a scary spot. Smoky Joe's? I don't remember the Smoky Joe's. Hermitage Road and like fifty eighth. Yeah, it's like, oh, no, that like forty eighth. <laughs> like the most violent little strip of land in Edmonton because there was just always fights back there and like people got dumped back there all the time. Serious? Yeah. That's where all that shit's going on with that toxic waste now. What, what shit's going on with what toxic waste? It was a plant called the Dom Tar plant, uh, which made like wood preservatives and that kind of stuff for like a hundred years. And then they redeveloped it as lots it said that it was fine, but it's really not fine. And all the people that bought all these lots, like they can't play outside their kids can't be in the dirt like everybody's got to sell their property at like dirt fucking cheap and like the houses is yeah. like the housing markets are like completely like yeah. they're all toxic yeah the whole like strip so if you drive down her or victoria trail right before you turn onto the yellowhead like right by the soccer center there you'll see a blue fence okay yeah, with a bunch of like stay out signs and stuff that's all that land wild it's crazy. people live in there yeah there's a bunch of houses apparently where the houses are it's safer but they're not allowed to do any more development just fucking crazy though people are losing their shit i didn't even know this was a thing because when you um i think it's seven years like let's say you have a um, a gas station and a gas station goes under they leave petrocan so husky whatever that land can't do anything for i think it's seven years yeah. like it just oh, has I think to it's longer than that 10 years something like that like 10 years, that one place like that. on white just got redeveloped yeah and that and one even, spot on white yeah and even and even landfills and stuff like that they can't yeah. be like that one on white's been like been uh, condemned for how many years I would have been way before I was in university. Yeah, that was a like long time ago, man. That's Where like is that one? Years. Where is it that might one? might even again? be like 20 years or something stupid Because they like just that. put the property up this year. They just put the property up this year. Uh, and then there's another Stoker. gas station that went down uh, on White Avenue uh, closer to 99th Street. Yeah. And that one's just sitting waiting. That that's gonna be that's gonna be sitting. Is it a there. shell? There's two of them there. There's nothing there now. Street. Nothing, no, yeah. So the shell is on 99th Street. And then south down, there was like a little... Uh, uh, it used to be a gas station, and then next to it used to be like a um, a little mechanic shop. Yeah. And then the gas station went down, but the mechanic shop was up for a long time, and now that's gone, and it's just literally like a fenced off piece of land. Yeah, just like yeah. where the barber shop is and stuff like that. Yeah. There. Oh, okay, Fire yeah, H2O. that one on White Ave has got that big tower there now. Like yeah. it's almost too big. It's like weird. Yeah, they big. just finished it. And yeah, okay, yeah, that's where that called? empty lot was. What's the Chai Tea place? Remedy just opened in there this week. Oh, and I heard that Remedy is insane. Isn't it? Like nice? Yeah, like really nice. Yeah, like they did a good all job. All brand new. Everything looks beautiful. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, it's what? It's 20 some odd years that that shit has to it's sit there. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, let's tell people kind of who you are because uh, you you, uh, you own a little bit of a restaurant yeah. here. You're in the restaurant business. Yeah. And, uh, um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about yourself so we know who you are. 36. Grew up in Olds, Alberta. Moved to Camrose when I was 14. Lived there until I was 19 when I came to university here. Yeah. Got a political science and a sociology degree from the U of A. Was well on my way to law school and uh, needed some money. So I started cooking. Started as a dishwasher at Joey's. Worked my way up there. Did seven years with the Joey company. Uh, ended up as the chef at Joey Sherwood Park. I opened three restaurants for them across Canada. And then I uh, finally got tired of that and decided I wanted to go see if I could actually cook in a from scratch kitchen <coughs> and not open bags and that kind of shit. So yeah. went and worked at Lux, started as a dishwasher there and ended up the executive chef there three years later. You you went from opening Joey's restaurants to a dishwasher again. Yeah, yeah. When I met with Paul to do my interview for Century Hospitality Group, I said that I wanted to go as far down the ladder as I possibly could and prove that I could get back up and just see if I could actually cook. Shoe felt. Yeah. So you went to Paul and was like, hey, this is my experience, but I want to be a dishwasher. What yep. was his reaction to that? Yep. I didn't even know this story was a thing. He was more than willing to let me try it and just said that I was going to be paid appropriately. And that I couldn't, Don't get expect, to, couldn't expect to take a chef's salary. And I, I knew that. I had money when I left Joey's. So I decided that I wanted to to go there and see how long it would take me to be a cook and how long it would take me to get back up the ladder. And at that point I was so burnt out from Joey's. Like I was working 85 hour weeks all the time. Yeah, it doesn't end. Um, so I just wanted to just not have fucking responsibility for a while. See my, at that point, my fiance and just 
try to spend some time being a guy again and rekindle some friendships. Having and, a life. You know, have some hobbies and shit, which I never ended up doing. But uh, yeah. So I washed dishes for a little while, ended up as a cook. Within a year, I was the junior sous chef at Lux. And within a year after that, I was the sous chef. And then I took over the executive chef nine months after that. And I was the executive chef there for two and a half years. And then opportunity came to walk away. The funding and stuff to open Northern Chicken happened. And Andrew and I had been joking around about a fried chicken joint for years. And you're like, and then you're like, hey, like, this, we could actually do it. I right? actually have the money to do this now. Like, what do you think? And he said, sure. So we wrote a business plan and got drunk one day and came up with the name and reached out to some friends and got a fucking killer logo done. And Okay, so where, now did, the we're name, where did the name come from, Northern Chicken, then? They were drunk. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, we went to craft for brunch and got drunk and we're just sort of throwing darts at the wall on what cool names would be for a fried chicken joint. And everything we sort of Googled, somebody had a trademark on. We're like, well, we're doing like Southern chicken, but we're in the North and we want to make sure we're using Canadian ingredients. And we're like, Canadian chicken, no, that's fucking stupid. Like Northern chicken. So we Googled it. And no there's a place in a place in Toronto called Dirty Bird. Yeah. And they use Northern fried chicken as their hashtag, but they don't trademark it. It's not called Northern chicken. It's just. That's a that's hashtag. You can't, it. yeah, you that's can't. A search, there's a search the term. That yeah. 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 So. No, we kept looking. There's a northern chicken in Cyprus, like in Greece. But other than that, nobody else has the, has the name. So we decided it's that it sounded cool. It's like Canada North yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, we just, you know, we shopped it around some people and people really liked it. And they're like, fuck it, let's just go with it. I, I, and I we were still sort yeah. of like really flying by the seat of the pants. Like Andrew and I had never opened a restaurant before. Andrew's dad has an MBA, so he helped us write a business plan. But it was a we sort of figure it out. Uh, met with our third partner, got some help from him. Originally, it was just some consulting to go through our business plan and see if he thought it was viable, and then it turned into a partnership. But decided, uh, I think it was like March 3rd, we launched the logo. Yeah. And uh, we did our first event like April 8th. We did a pop up at a little restaurant called Dovetail, uh, which is actually across the street from where we ended up opening. Yeah. And it was fucking nuts. Like 400 people showed up. Yeah. We were out of chicken an hour and a half in. And it was just like ridiculous, Un unlike anything we thought we were ever going to have. So at that point, we we're like, well, proof of concept. Maybe we, we can do something. Still didn't have a location. We were looking at places. We were spending two or three days a week looking at restaurants around the city, trying to find something that was going to fit. And you know, had a couple places that we were ready to write offers on. And then this place fell into our lap. And you know, the relish went under. And through some connections, we were the first call. And we got into a little bit of a bidding war with a couple other local restaurants and ended up getting picked as the guys that got it. So got keys September 12th and opened November 4th. And it's been a wild it's adventure a of throwing hell chickens around. Two and around. a half years, like 330,000 pieces of chicken. <laughs> That's wild. Um, yeah, yeah I, I haven't done that number in a little bit. That was like a month ago. So I don't know what we sold this month, but yeah, done that, like 5,800 bottles of beer. Dude, that makes me so happy. Yeah. That you have the, the total chicken count. Oh, I, I'm, a, I'm a numbers nerd. So no other like restaurant that does that, of, though. All that kind of stuff. Just That's when it I can It tickles it, eh? Well, that's how you make the decisions, though, yeah. right? Like, if you don't know the numbers, how do you make choices? Like, that's where all the analytics... And that's the one thing that, like, that's probably one of the hardest things to do is to have someone to actually put the data together and have the data in the, and in a way that you can kind of actually make choices and decisions based on what's actually happening. Yeah. Right, measuring that stuff and, and knowing what to measure, and uh, and then yeah, it makes your makes your decision making way easier because you're just like, well, duh, just follow the trends, follow the numbers, right? This the numbers, is what's selling. The numbers don't lie. Yep. You know. This is what sells. This is not what sells. Yeah. Like, like why are you going to keep this thing on the menu yep. if fucking nobody buys it? No, it's we've had you. some serious duds. We're, like, <laughs> fuck, we're selling 800 a week of this thing, and we're selling three a week of this thing. Like, what's a three a week thing? Wings. No one was eating wings. Wings didn't ever what? sell. And the funny thing is every time... Well, you don't we go like, to a chicken place every to Every time you do wings is like wing. a feature or something, everybody's like, oh, wings, this is awesome. We're coming down for them. And then the next week we sell like four orders. Weird. And it's like, okay, this is just dumb. So we played around. Like We're on our fourth variation of wings now um, before we just took them off the menu, this last menu change. And it's just... it's prep and waste and stupid. And so you have no wings there right now? We don't now. do wings anymore. Damn. There, there's still wings like... 
it's still part of the chicken. We bring in between 200 and 220 birds a morning, and yeah. uh, a guy cuts them all, and then we brine them. And you know what you should do for the wings? You should have. I'm, I'm giving this. I'll give it to you. you should, <laughs> He's looking at him like, yeah, okay. You should have like a uh, uh, like once a week have like. Um, a hot wing contest and basically like when people come in and see whoever can eat the hottest so we're wings. Doing that he once, does that we're doing shit. that once yeah. a month. Yeah. See, that's the shit, we're man. Like, yeah, you, you hold uh, this event. Similar to a, you know, famous YouTube show. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then you sit down and so we do what like, we do with chicken fingers instead and of then, wings. And then they yeah, give them a little prize at the end of that shit. And we're like, it's, 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 but just the hottest, the hottest of the wings. Like, Dude, this guy puts up uh, Instagram videos. Uh, yeah, guys getting them, sick. Of you, get, of you getting sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The best ones are you. You're like, you're like, there's this big vat behind you, like bubbling, and you're like, oh, oh, oh. The you're last like, one we did lot. for the last hot ones or hot seat challenge that we did, the uh, the sauce literally, when I made it, it cleared our entire restaurant. What do you mean? Like people were just like, like we opened up the oven, and the the Carolina Reapers that I'd been toasting for it burned a little bit, and they just blew out into the restaurant, and, and people like, were like <sighs> gagging, and customers had to leave, and a couple staff members had to go outside for like twenty minutes. Just like felt like such an asshole. Dude, that's so funny. Actually, it's like Carolina Reapers are three times pepper spray. They are Depend- depending on on where you're getting them from and how potent they are, but anywhere between three and two and a half times pepper spray. What's the high? What's the hottest pepper? Uh, Reapers, theoretically, right now. Theoretically. Guinness has Reapers as the hottest. There's oh, independent testing that shows that Apocalypse and Red Lava is hotter. It's also Pepper X, which is from the last dab that the Hot Ones did. Yeah. Nobody's seen Pepper X other than the last dab hot sauce. Like, no seeds exist for it. He's not selling any actual peppers. So There's it doesn't no really... Dried... There's no dry effects anywhere in the world that anybody can buy. Yeah. So some of the hot sauce forms are saying that it's just a scam. I don't know that. I'm not him. Like, the guy created the Reaper, so I'm sure he can create anything else he wants. But yeah. I, I always end up... Um, it's weird that hot peppers have, like, a cult following behind them, which is really strange. And there's that... Uh, is it, what, the Scoville guy? What's the guy's name? Mike Scoville? The Scoville unit. Oh, I don't, I don't oh. remember the name. That's something from the early 1900s. Is it? Yeah. Oh, there's a dude and his name's Scoville. Oh. Yeah. yeah, and he just pounds back. He'll just eat peppers and be like, yeah, this is, well, it's not that bad. And as I end up on the YouTube, like the deep part of YouTube, not yeah. even the weird part of YouTube, but like the people eating hot chilies yeah. part of YouTube and like and crying. It'll be like three in the morning yeah. and I'll be watching mother truckers like, eat, what is it called? Plutonium 379 or something? Oh, yeah. That extract or whatever? Yeah. Gabe's be, Insanity Sauce uses that. And yeah. Like Bob's 357. Is it Bob's 357? Yeah, there is Bob's 357. Yeah. I just bought 250 grams of pure capsaicin powder. Yeah, that's... So 16 million Scoville crystals. So I got a half a pound of that. Just left Australia yesterday. Yeah, what do you do with that? Like, that stuff's uh, deadly. Two, do you grams, two grams into two liters of ranch made it inedible. Like, it was just too painful. It, people ate it, but it was, like... <laughs> People cried. One of my best friends is a cop. He had some and he just cried and cried and cried. He's like, this is the worst than getting pepper sprayed. <laughs> yeah, hot peppers are wild, man. Those people will. And then you watch these dudes and they're like, they're taking that shit that you're only supposed to have. And it says, do not eat. It, it always says as the warnings no. and stuff. And like, it's a, this is an extract. You're supposed to use one little touch for like five liters. Have you ever watched these videos? No. Dude, I'll show you tonight, man. These these people will eat this shit and then they just they challenge themselves. They do these like little food challenges where they'll pound back a, like a crazy hot pepper and then be like, "Okay, I got to go 10 minutes without any milk or anything." And then they just hit their phone, they show it to the camera, and then they just sit there on YouTube in front of their camera like crying. Just die. Just die. You've seen. You know exactly what I'm talking about, I can't right? Ha- I can't handle that stuff cuz as soon as I have anything hot, I go <clears throat> I get the hiccups and they don't go away. Yeah. Like they don't go away. I have the hiccups for like like oh. 30, 40 minutes. The last sauce I made was called "It's Gonna Be a Shitty Wednesday" because I made it Tuesday, Tuesday for night. an event Tuesday night, <laughs> and it like it was. I don't know exactly the Scoville unit because it's super super expensive to get it tested. But I took 10 million capsaicin oil, diluted it a quarter, and then bulked it back up with Reapers. So it's around two and a half million, 2.6 million Scovilles, so and like. That fucked people up. <laughs> Do you get a weird joy of doing that? To oh people? yeah, <laughs> especially free. the guys that come in super cocky. Like, it's called "We're Not Fucking Around" on our menu. <laughs> Is it actually called that? That's what that? WNFA. Yeah. Like, you know, oh, we have original nac- hot, nac- extra hot WNFA and mustard chicken. WNFA stands for "We're Not Fucking Around." 
What's mustard chicken? Is that we got a type of chicken that's dipped in mustard? Oh, I love like that an, thing. An actually. English style mustard. I think yeah. you had it last time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I thought. Okay, I thought the way you'd set it up is like. You know what I realized? Oh yeah, we don't have that. We don't have. A, you know, you guys keep talking. Get, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get that organized. <laughs> too not, much shit going on. We're not paying Mike, Microsoft. Uh, yeah, Microsoft's not picture. getting paid for this stuff, man. We're not getting paid for this stuff. We get our logo spinning on here, actually. Oh, nice. I think I saw that on the last one. Yeah, it just kind of, it just kind of flips. Yeah. Yeah, so people that come in and are like, you know, fuck, white boys don't make hot food or no, whatever. No. And like, <laughs> people say that. <laughs> You're like, this white boy's doing it, man. Well, I, I eat habaneros for breakfast. All right, sure. Okay, sure. This is 10 times hotter than habaneros. Dude, that's so funny that and people do that. And then they cry, and then I laugh. <laughs> like, the whole thing came from, we, we originally started with original and hot chicken. We yeah. do Nashville style chicken, so out of the fryer into chili oil, bread and butter pickles, white bread, put it on the plate. Dude, that bread's amazing. Italian center. Fucking awesome. I love that bread. And that pickle, like, yo, mm. if you're ever in Edmonton and you guys on the live, go to Northern Chicken because the guy kills it, man. And that, and you need the, oh, your side, your nacho. All the Dorito mac and cheese. All the Dorito mac and cheese, man. Okay, anyways, yeah, sorry, keep going. Yeah, so we did that and we had hot chicken and this dude comes up and he calls me a pussy. He's like, that's not fucking hot. You're a fucking pussy if you think that's hot. He, he does it right. He does it right over the line, from in, front our, of like, your staff. in front of our staff. And like, I have a really horribly bad temper. Yeah. Like, <laughs> fuck you, buddy. Come back tomorrow. I'll fucking make you I'll something. I'll fuck you up. <laughs> so he's like, "Well, I can't come back tomorrow. I'll come back next week." This that was even worse because then I had time to actually get shit. So I ordered Carolina Reapers. I ordered ghost powder or ordered ghost peppers. I ordered Trinidad scorpions, and I got all of it in for the next week. And he comes down all proud with his girlfriend. He's like, yeah, you like that shit. Try to make me cry. It's like, okay, buddy. So we made it and we served it to him, and he fucking bawled. He ended up throwing up in the bathroom. And then what? And his girlfriend came over and thanked us. And then a couple other people that were in there were like, well, I want to try this hot stuff. So we just started making it, and then it just progressed and progressed and progressed until now. It's like people challenge us. So I'm like, sure, I'll make you fucking hot shit. Dude, that's where that came from? That's yeah. the best story I've ever heard. That's just me being an ass because somebody called us a pussy. <laughs> I just don't take that kind of shit very well, so. Dude, I full on, I full on appreciate that because that shit's hilarious. I didn't know that. And then it just sort of ran with, once people started knowing that we were the place for hot stuff and coming in, like, It Dog's Hardcore Chicken, I think is probably hotter than ours. Which is? It Dog? It Dog has hard, Dude, it dog's sick their too. hardcore chicken's fucking hot. Yeah. I don't know which one's hotter. Like at that point for me, it's just to too whatever. Hot. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. people come in now, and that's what they want to do. So we're running with it, and it's a nice little niche for us. And you know, I get to play with some stuff that I actually enjoy and make hot sauces. Like we got nine hot sauces on the menu right now, all of them that we're making in house. Would you ever bottle it and sell it? Maybe we're, not the we, hot, hot one. We so. sell it in house. You we do? sold 140 bottles of hot sauce this year or this month. Wow. You like you label it and everything yep. and have it like yep. more than chicken hot yeah, sauce. Yeah, to get it on store shelves is a little different. There's some legality there around like nutritional information yeah, and that's best what I'm before, saying. that kind of shit. Yeah, yeah. But to sell it in the restaurant, it's just classed as a to-go item. Are you serious? Wow. So I we got bottles of all of them available right now. Yeah, because because when you do it on shelf, it needs to be sealed properly. You need yeah. information, this, that, best. Oh, I didn't know no, if you... But if we just sell it as a to-go item, then it's fine. It's the same as you taking your chicken out with you. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's just a nicely done up 10 ounce bottle of hot sauce. Hey, Adam boy. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's just, we just so happen to sell it in this really nice yeah. bottle. Yeah, that's with this it. nice little label on it. Yeah, this nice, this nice little, little label. How long top. do they normally last for? Uh, it's fermented for six weeks and then it will, as long as you put it in the fridge, it will last for a good six months. Some of them are cooked sauces. They last a little bit less, but uh, we let everybody know when they buy it. If it's fridge stable, if it's not, like what they want to do. We just, for our one year, or our two second year birthday, we released a hot sauce that we put into a barrel on our first birthday. Wow. So we had a, we had a whiskey and a red wine barrel yeah. from Hanson Distilleries in the West End. Okay. Uh, so it was originally a red wine barrel. He got it, put, I shouldn't call it whiskey, put rye into it, because it's not whiskey until it's been in oak for three years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after he pulled that out and bottled all the, all the rye, he gave us the barrel and put the hot sauce in it on our first birthday. Weird. That was actually like the day before our first birthday, but, and then we pulled it out on our second birthday. And it's just been sitting there? Yeah, it's just been in the wood. It got super cool. Really, really, like it's probably the best thing I've ever made in my life. 
It sold out in nine days. Well, it took you a year. It took you a year to make it. Yeah. How excited did you open the, like the little lid of the of the keg and you're just yeah. like or not the cask or whatever? And you're like, yo, what's going on in yeah. here? Were you able does to, this suck? That yeah, was this the big like. Did we just drop a thousand bucks on peppers for something <laughs> that could suck balls? Yeah, yeah. And it didn't. It was super good. That's cool. There's actually. one bottle of it left at the shop, and then Hansen has one bottle on their shelf. But all we did 150 bottles of it, so we sold all 148. Did you make? Do you make another batch though for as next? As soon as year? we get another barrel, I got all the peppers ready to go. Um, you can't recycle the barrel, then, eh? <laughs> we gave it to Brewsters. They're making a beer out of it. What the heck? Like this is the biggest repurposed like. Oh, thing. And then once they make a beer out of it, I'm gonna try to drop hot sauce into it again. <laughs> oh, but so, I got a so line you need on. To get it, you need to get it. You need to get the beer. You need to get a beard, and then once it's beard, like brewed. No, I could have dropped another. No, he could have dropped into another it, one. But yeah. I just. I got the opportunity to put beer into it, and so I figured I would. And it's gonna be, I think we're gonna have to take four kegs out of it. Yeah. Cause it's gonna be strong, but that'd be cool. It's a one-off, hopefully it tastes good. A hot beer? I trust beer? the guy at Brewster's that they can make something good out of it. I don't think it will be hot. Yeah. Because all that heat came out into the hot sauce, it's just gonna have all those pepper notes to it. So it shouldn't be excessively warm. It will just have really cool cherry and like, Dude, that that's really notes. freaking dope. I'm just like... And I think I got five more barrels coming. If everything's gone well and some of the emails I've sent in the last couple of weeks, I should have five barrels coming in the next little bit. So we can drop one in a month. And then hopefully we can just keep it going and not ever run out again. Oh, and have like a back catalog of it. Yeah. Dude, I that's... think I got a Laphroaig barrel. So like super peaty, like really, what? really smoky. Where are you getting these from? There's barrel brokers all over the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> with, broker. How with do you even uh, a barrel dude, they're, ex- broker. they're expensive as hell. 275 to 400 like, bucks a barrel. Do they just like get wood? Like are they just carpenters that just make well, barrels? Well, they just oh. buy them from distilleries once they've taken the whiskey out of them. Yeah. Yeah, but someone's got to make that. There's oh, yeah. There's co- a Cooper. Like to be a Cooper is a, an actual trade. It's a trade, yeah. Like, I, don't think, I don't think oh, you so can take a, a Cooper there's, class in Canada. No. Though. But I know so in the States, res- like there's it's, resellers oh, yeah. that basically like just say like once you're done, I'll buy, yeah. the, buy the barrel off. The to make it. bourbon, you could, uh, it has to go into fresh oak. Yeah. So once you've made bourbon in a barrel, you can never make bourbon in that barrel again. You can make all sorts of other whiskeys out of that, but you can't make American bourbon out of it ever again. Yeah. A lot so of technicalities those, though. All yeah. those barrels get sold to breweries, to hot sauce makers, to wineries. How to much wherever. is a barrel again? A thousand bucks? No. Oh, you can get them for 400 bucks. There's a guy in the north side right now that's got a shipping container full and of them. how big are they just like For 175 bucks each. They just like cake size? Yeah. Yeah? Well, they're pretty it's big, 200 man. liter no, barrels. Dude, they're pretty big. Yeah, be, they're heavy. Like yeah. you need a pallet jack to move them around. We rolled the one that we had, but lifting it up <laughs> took three guys. Yeah, l- think of an oak barrel, man. An oak, like, like they're, like those French, those French wines. Like well, I've those seen things, those, that they have those, but you walk through those things and they're just these big yeah. massive barrels. That, these like, are 200 liter barrels, or yeah. the Lefroy ones are 125s. Yeah. There's a guy in the north side that's got them on Kijiji right now for between 125 and 175 a barrel. What? But I don't know how well they've been stored. Yes. And if they get dry, then you right. get they don't seal anymore once they get dry. So, so if this guy's just had them out in Edmonton winters, like they're kind of busted. They might suck balls, and I don't want to drop 175 bucks on something I can't use. Yeah, that'd be annoying. Yeah, that's wild. Barrel broker, though, what a weird job that would be. Mm-hmm. Well, not a weird job, just kind of like it's you know what, mom job. and dad, I'm gonna be a barrel broker. Well, it's just like the niche. same guys who basically. Have you ever heard about these guys who have been like uh, they stole maple syrup? In Montreal, they had the, the maple syrup heist. Never heard of this in my life. They, they fucking yeah, jacked it. So maple syrup. Huge amount ma- of maple syrup. So maple syrup is like a, is a, the maple syrup market is uh, controlled by like a maple syrup organization. So what happens? What? Is, yeah. <laughs> is so this a thing? It's a thing. So they basically keep control of the of the market. So that way, if if the if the season's slow. So for instance, if you're a farmer, you just farm. A, let's say let's just use a round number. You farm a hundred barrels every year. So you're always farming 100 barrels. If only uh, 50 of your barrels sold, you still make for the, all 100, but they store into a reserve fund the extra barrels. So if there's an influx a year where there's lots of people buying maple syrup, they keep the prices the same, but then they use the ones from the... And this is real maple syrup, not like... Yeah, like Canadian what maple What is it? Syrup. Bu- butter flavored yeah. syrup from... Maple syrup? So, yeah, I don't know what that is. This is from trees and actual yeah, legit Yeah, so shit. there's like maple syrup farmers. So they have like this organization that they basically are part of and they store it into like a maple syrup bank. And then someone on the inside, because it's inside of a maple syrup bank, Someone on the inside just went in and took all the maple syrups and replaced them with fucking water and stole all the barrels and then sold them black market to the to the states. 
and stole like two point like two million dollars. Huge amount of maple Fuck, syrup. Fucking just stole all this maple syrup. I'm like each canister of maple syrup was worth more than oil. Like it was like no, they were like a hundred. Is... They were like hundred and fifty dollars a barrel or something. Like crazy, more than that. More than Way that. more like than thousand, that. Thousand dollars a barrel. Like yeah. crazy numbers, man. We like, pay four liters. Four liters, we pay like three hundred ninety bucks. Yeah, yeah real, so real maple syrup's expensive. So they as were hell. and they were jacking the barrels, and they basically just took someone on the inside, just picked it up, boom, dropped them down. And they replaced it with another barrel full of all water. In, all in like one night. Food. They theft did is, it over a fucking months, bro. Food theft is a crazy, crazy thing. Like, like yeah. somebody jacked like four years ago. Somebody jacked like a third of the almond supply in California. <laughs> what? How am I look, not know about there's this? There's an almond. If you Google almond theft, a guy took a the almond theft. guy, a bunch of guys hijacked a <laughs> tractor trailer with a huge amount of the almond crop for all of all of California. See, but How are you supposed, jacked, supposed jacked, to sell them? No, no but in order to, the price of in order to steal that kind, roof. in order yeah. to steal that kind of stuff, you have to be in in the industry and have yeah. to know the value of it, and you have to have a buyer. Like you have to, because like otherwise, black moment. All, it's I'm a just black, picturing the guy, the guy selling the almonds on the street like this. Like, well, no, no, the guy. Oh, like, you got to know people. The guy. Yeah, know, the, the deal's already been brokered before they do the theft. A right? meat they shop got, in Calgary got jacked two years ago for a huge amount of dock and a huge amount of pork. I could see that. You know that all that kind so of random. stuff is like. Because like if a guy can get his like let's say almonds, for, he gets almonds for half price on the black market. He makes a bigger profit from it. So if he makes a deal for a guy to jack them. And then he buys them off him. He makes a bigger too. profit on the back end. Yeah, you, he's you, got a distrib- He's got a distribution market. Yeah, but when uh, the government asks you where you bought your almonds from for your uh, little... well, they mix it in. It's like if you buy like uh, if you buy seventy five percent of your almonds from legitimate places, you just cook your books until you, so that way the the twenty five percent that you didn't buy, just you just basically right spread it out between all of them. I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it just seems a little wild. People want to fuck around on stuff. They will. Yeah, they're fucking around <laughs> on some on almond theft. I'm gonna look into that. Do you know the guy's name? By no, I just remember when it happened when and through. the price of almonds went through. The went roof. through the roof. That happened with limes yeah. a little while. Limes ago, of the actually. Mexican cartels. Too. The cartel, yeah, they did the limes. That they, one to me makes little sense. They stole limes. No, they just jacked the. They started taking over all the orchards and started jacking the prices up and just artificially inflated the price of limes for like eight months. It was insane. A lime was like, what are they, like four like bucks a, each? Yeah. <laughs> like, like I don't know we if it got up to four. four. It, got up to they... like, it got up to like a buck 95 a lime. A lime, yeah. Point. We'll go two dollars a lime. So like a little, a little case of limes was like, they were expensive it's, as Yeah, that. we weren't putting them on people's drinks anymore and like... Yeah, no garnish. Like limes were like... Because the cartel stole that was the, That was the rumor, right? But... I think it's true. I think it's true. Everything I've heard was that it was the cartels, and like it was, we had meetings with food suppliers about it, and, like, and they're just like, "Well, we yeah, can't I remember get the it being a thing at CHG cut. that we had a head office meeting about lime usage, lime and how usage, we were going to yeah. make sure that the bars all cut down the amount of limes that we were giving out, and staff wasn't allowed to have limes and drinks anymore." <laughs> Yeah, because it was like expensive. It was like a, a wedge would have been a two dollar lime. You're getting cut in half. I'm thinking one, two, thirty cent wedge. Yeah, thirty cent wedge, pretty much. Which uh, thirty cents doesn't sound like a lot, but that adds up pretty quick time when you bust out three rum and cokes. You're at a dollar, whatever now. When you bust out a thousand of them, yeah, yep. starts to add up. Uh, two hundred seat restaurant, two hundred waters go out. Three hundred bucks is a lot. It's That's like, like someone's salary. The fucking worst. Okay, tell. Okay, Matt, can you tell me this? Can we talk about hot water lemons? Oh, <laughs> are we allowed to talk about hot water lemon? Is that a tough subject? <laughs> well, you can charge for that, can't you? Like, I mean, yeah, yeah, you no, that's what there's gonna put it on your menu, but people well, that do it generally get shit on. There's well, a girl that there, did that. I remember, there was a chick I remember, that did that. I remember I, that was exactly I saw um, someone who made a post. A girl complained about the review, yeah, and said that you char- She came in there, she didn't order anything, sat, took a seat, right, with the thing, and ordered a hot water and a lemon, and the girl charged her two dollars for it, yeah. And it goes, Why am I getting charged two dollars for it? It goes, Well, I had to. I had to go in the back and I had like, cause the girl wrote a bad review, I got charged. So she said, I had to go back and cut the lemons up. I had to boil the water. All of that costs electricity. You and know, this and that. I had to give you a seat. Up. This and that, like, go, and you only ordered a water and a lemon. I'm yeah. just like, so we charged you the cost at what it cost to actually produce that water and lemon for you. Yep. And so like, they were, they were pissed off cause you like looking at the electricity of the building how much electricity was used to boil the kettle, the water that they used and having to, how much it cost to get the water into the building. And her the, wages. Her wages in terms the of five having minutes to do the things. To do that. And then the five minutes yep. it took to do that plus the cutting of the lime. It was just like $2 is a fair price, you know? Uh, so, hey. 
if you if you charge for hot water lemon on things though, but you don't tell them this is a charge. Yeah, you got to tell people that, that people kind get of stuff. Cheese. You got to tell people. It's like the people that charge a buck for water when you get Q water at a restaurant, and that all that money's getting donated to a charity or whatever. You still got to tell people. Yeah. We just we live in a world where food is artificially super super low. Like super what? The cost of food is artificially just incredibly low. Yeah. For what we get and what. The <coughs> labor that's involved in feeding the population is just, like, so farmers are kept artificially low for the price of their products. Everybody complains when grain goes up or when beef goes up or anything like that. Farmers are using minimum wage laborers or across the United States, immigrant laborers that are getting paid almost nothing. Yeah. Like if you look at the, since Trump came in, the amount of like just craziness that's occurring in the vegetable market in California, the amount of crops that are just rotting in fields because nobody's willing to go do the work. Because they're scared they're going to get booted out? Yeah, well, the, well, the immigrants aren't going to go. Because are these illegal immigrants? Lots of them, yeah. Yeah. And then nobody in the United States is willing to go pick an entire field of tomatoes for 18 bucks or whatever the, they were paying the immigrants. So those food <laughs> prices are artificially low from the farmer. Yeah. You take it to a restaurant. We need to make a little bit of money on it, but like you charge five bucks for a piece of chicken and people freak out or 18 bucks for a burger. But you look at all the way down that chain, somebody's got to make a little bit of money on it. And all of that is done on minimum wage or lower workers. Yeah. And it's just crazy how we think that food should be so cheap when you actually go back and look at it. Like this is something that somebody's growing. The water intake that's involved in that, the feed, all that kind of stuff, transportation to market, safety. Like, look at why there's all these crazy outbreaks all over the United States where everything's so cheap. Like, they're skimping on safety. They're skimping on their feed. All of a sudden, E. coli gets into the food system. Salmonella gets into the food system. It's all traced back to the fact that we don't want to pay the right amount of money for food. That's wild. When you when you think about it like that, it's coming from a farmer. But there is um, economies of scale. So... Yeah. Obviously, the more grain you have, the less it costs, like yep. per unit. But right, everybody gets stomped on. <laughs> like who? Like like of a restaurant here, for yeah, example. And like this the is the farmers too and everybody else gets stomped on the whole process. Everybody wants it to be super super cheap, and we're more than willing to pay exorbitant <laughs> amount of money for all sorts of stuff that costs really 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 little. Yeah, electronics, the shoes, electronics. Shoes. We're getting beat up on all the other stuff, yep. like all the other stuff like here. And then you like how much is a Gucci bag, for instance? People are paying for Gucci and Coach, and I'm just like, yo, man, like that bag costs them like 20 bucks to make, and they make them in bulk, and they're selling it to you for three thousand or whatever. I don't, it's like, probably, it's probably what, not, what it's probably not twenty dollars. Those are handmade, like like those higher end brands. <clears throat> Yeah, there's someone. But they're legit, still not five thousand dollars. That's, that's going into what you're paying for. There is substantially better in what the last little while with what they're paying their what their workers. Yeah, and that what kind you're of paying stuff. for is you're paying for but a commercial your ad. Your three dollar H and M shirt. Yeah, okay. Like, how do you afford to make a shirt for three bucks? Just and just, make money on it. The economies of scale, like you just have to sell so many units of it, you or you're paying your staff nothing. Yeah, or they're uh, um, um, autonomizing everything. So which means yeah. that they're basically. They get a shop. They got five guys running a, a shop that's producing it used to like. Be 200. Well, when I was doing the ho- when I was doing the hotel, um, the the giant Airbnb, uh, I was sourcing out um, like bed linens and everything like that. And toilet then, paper you were talking to me about too. Oh well, yeah, toilet paper is insane. But like just when you buy stuff from China in bulk, it's like so low. Like I was, we're looking at toilet paper for it was two hundred fifty dollars a ton. It was well, just from like directly from China. Yeah. And this was, uh, you know how we get, you, like restaurants get the big ass rolls? These weren't the big ones. These were just regular, yep. normal size rolls. But you had to buy 10 tons at a time. So it was 10 tons for 2,500 bucks, right? I think that'd be enough toilet paper to last the rest of my life yep. forever. Dude, okay, this is a big problem. This is a big problem. Everyone's buying shit from China because it's so cheap. What does China buy from everyone else? Because Probably what chaos. happens is, is that if everyone keeps, like the way cash flow works, Cash flow is meant to basically keep within the same group, so you just basically cycle it around each other, yep. right? If everyone keeps sending fucking all their currency to China, China keeps the currency and sends all their cheap shit to us, we end up with an economy of full of cheap shit and yep. toilet paper that we've thrown out. So all of this, all this stuff that we're thrown out, and then we're going to run out of no, we have no money because they have it all. Well, how the fuck are we getting it back? You know, like, do, do we, does anybody know? Like, what do we buy from China? Like, what does China buy from, from Canada? Oil, canola. Yeah, there all is. The thing, all the things that they just shut the market off because of this stuff with that 
Wally Check. To which know? one? Uh, the head of Huawei or whatever, the phone company. Yeah. The vice president of that got arrested in Vancouver for espionage. The Wowie, charges. Wowie, the Wowie Wowie, company. Yeah. yeah. And so China retaliated by shutting off canola and oil imports. Yeah, they buy they buy stuff. From they us. buy huge amounts of they buy canola, amount of stuff from oil, us. that kind of stuff from us. But it's all raw materials. There's yeah. no manufactured products, so that's you losing your whole economy based on processing all those products. Yeah, we used to have a great manufactured economy in Canada. Yeah, yeah. we have zero right now. I we don't manufacture it. anything. We we act, there's imports and exports. That's the whole thing that like I, I'm noticing too with like Trump, like with Trump is like Trump's like saying, "Okay, fuck you," yeah, like because America is the best at middle, uh, being mid, the middlemen. They're salesmen. They basically buy shit from everywhere else cheap, get shit cheap, and then they sell it because they have the mass amount of people there, and then they sell it to all their people. And the guys who are basically like middling everything are making a fucking beating. But they're not manufacturing anything nope. anymore. Like that's what like, you just look at Trump, it's just like shit, we're not manufacturing shit. Nobody's buying anything from the United States. The United States is just consuming everyone's shit. You know, well, like, there's, there, there's something to be said with like, um, you know, when it says you get a, a, a new pair of shoes or a new shirt or something made in Italy, you're like, ah, OK, this makes sense. This is Italian made like this is you can't make it anywhere else but in Italy. Like there's a different air about it and a different thing of quality. Same with uh, uh, like like things in the States, like uh, you buy a like my like I love American muscle cars. That's a that's a thing. Yep. I just like them because it's like. It's like, yo, this is made in the States. Like, you know, this is like American muscle. Like, there's, a, there's something to be said with that sort of thing. But I don't even, they don't even make, like, my car is probably not made in, I don't know if Dodge, like, the Dodge that I got, I don't know if that's, any of that's even made in the States. It's probably all from China and sent in. Most likely. I'm not going to. Mexico? You, even the cars. Mexico, yeah. Even the cars are basically, like, a lot yep. of the cars are coming from, like, Japan, China, Korea, like, Hyundai, Toyota. Um, you know, like all of these cars are coming from, from Asia and stuff like that. Like, yeah, we don't buy any of our own stuff because it's che- those cars are generally a little bit cheaper, no? Well, They're yeah. more, af- more affordable, more economical. I don't know. It's just uh, it's a, it's it's a, a weird situation. It's definitely a weird situation. But yeah, there's, there's definite trade with China, Stevie. Um, but yeah, it's crazy that they shut the whole thing down on us. Yeah, like canola and oil were the two big ones. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. Canola was the, the you, one. You know what? That's, like, that's, that's just... the next war that's actually happening right now. Like, it's, an econo- it's going to be an economic war because you have this glo- the global, everyone in, they're all fighting for power. They all want power, right? It's they're fu- a bunch of power hungry people that are just trying to, like, control everything. And I'm like, now it's just, a, it's an economic war where they're just like, Who's got the money? Who can shift it? And who, oh, oh, you want to be that way? I'm going to cut you off. You're not allowed to get this. You can't do that. But I'm just like, that's why I think it's always important to just stay local. If like, if we as a local community can basically maintain our own, our own system, our own society, our own like way of living, and we work within each other and, and take care of each other in a sense that like, you buy local, you buy from local farmers, you, you know, local businesses, Everything stays local. The money Continues flows in this and circle. it cycles yeah. locally. Like that's why some of these some of these cultures that are doing really really well, they buy from their own kind, they buy from their their communities, they buy from their own thing, and then they sell to everyone else. And then the, basically what happens is, is their communities get stronger and stronger and stronger. But like us as Canadians, we don't get that concept of basically like f- fucking taking care of your own. You know. You know. Yeah. I think I think Canada is a little bit fragmented when it comes to that. Too many people from too many different places. I don't agree with that. No. No, I think we're a pretty good melting pot in Canada, yep. and there's a lot of there's a lot of people here, especially with this generation, like a lot of people that are born here, that that are even though they come from different countries and stuff like that, they feel Canadian. Yep. Like and they I think are that Canadian. That's what makes us strong. Yeah. So we have such a different group of people. Like the like the, I know in the states it's. I, very, see, I see your point. I in the states, point. it's it's not a melting pot. In the states, it's, it's definitely assimilate. like oil. Like it's a mix of oil. You got these little communities, the little Italian community, yeah. little, little Chinese community, and they're all kind of separated. They kind of work together, but they have their own little community. It's because if you look back to when New York came in here, there was so many fi- so much fighting going on. Yeah. You had all those different gangs, and they were all trying to gain positioning. So that's what happens. They basically position themselves out in New York, and these different little cults and or not cults, but little uh, 
uh, nationality and grants on who it is, and then they just branch off from there, right? Then there's like so many people in the States because it's warm there. And you talk <laughs> to people in the States and it's like, I'm Scottish American or I'm Italian American or I'm whatever American. Right? I, see, like, I see what you're saying. Even yeah. two, three generations down the road, like your parents immigrated to New York in 1850 or whatever, 1870. You're still Irish. You're still Irish American. Irish like that's American, your, yeah. your identity is that. They Whereas you talk to most of us in Canada, like, I'm not Scottish Canadian. I'm Canadian. My I Scottish roots are, I know them because my family, but like, I don't, that's not my shit. I usually just say I'm first generation Canadian. Hmm. Like first gen. I don't get that too much, to be honest. My, my experience is when I, even people ask me, hey, Cam, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm Canadian, dude. Yep. They're like, no, 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 where are you really from? Yeah, like, like we don't, Canada. we don't push that <laughs> like background. It's, we live in this country and we do our thing. Yeah. And I think that's a huge difference between Canada and so many other places in the world is that we're really proud of being Canadian. And dude, man, like, and being in Canada, we seriously won the fucking lottery. Like, being born here, it's like, the fact, I, like, when I went to Europe, like, there's certain places that some of my friends couldn't go to because their passports wouldn't allow them into these countries. I'm like, what? You can't get in? And I'm just like, yet, yeah, with a Canadian passport... We're pretty much allowed anywhere. We're allowed Canadian anywhere in passports. the world. Anywhere in the world, they will just say, yeah, come on in, no problem. Come on in, no problem. But, like, there's certain people that can't go to, you know, South Africa. You can't go to this place. Like, there's certain places you can't cross because they're like, no, if you come in, you ain't leaving. Yeah. They know that. They know that some people are going to come into their country and they're going to leave. But when you're Canadian, you'll be like, they don't want to fucking stay. <laughs> you know? They're going to get the fuck out afterwards. They're going to come in here and visit, spend their money, and then leave, right? And go back home because everyone wants to be in Canada. Why would... I think that's their mentality, is that? But like with other with other countries, they have like all these restrictions on which passport can go into where. Yeah. So I'm like, we really won the lottery here, man, just by being here. Like it's a, it's like a lottery. Even when I drove uh, I drove to California one time, me and my buddy, and uh, we had no plans of returning. We just drove, but like the border agent was just like, so uh, where are you guys staying? We're like, I don't know, we'll figure it out. Where are you guys going? I don't know, we just want to go surfing. We'll probably end up in California at some point. They're like, what's the timeline for this? We're like, I don't know, a couple weeks, a couple months. I don't know, we'll see, see what the money situation's like. Like, I don't know, we'll see what's good. And they're like, okay, cool, just stay safe and have fun. A little pat on the back and on our way. They let you in? Yeah, they let us in like that. It was hilarious. It's not like that anymore, but it used to be for sure. This is Canadian, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was only a couple of years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, it wasn't that bad. It was like... I think probably because they were so honest about yeah. it, though. Because, like, they were just like, no, we're just going on a road trip. And my buddy my buddy had a mullet and short shorts. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like they're looking in our trunk and stuff and he's just standing out there with a mullet and short shorts and i was wearing like one of those like uh oh what type of shirts are those <laughs> like it was just like so asinine it was they probably saw us at the border and they're like yo man these people are idiots man let them in they're not gonna do any harm like worst thing you're gonna do is probably i don't know drown in the ocean or some shit like oh that's, man that's funny that's funny yeah shit was uh it was a definite funny Funny experience, but I, they've definitely tightened that little situation up, I feel. Yep. I don't think that's happening anytime soon for me. Oh, man. So, what else can you tell us? I don't know. I want a chicken restaurant. We play hip-hop. Serve lots of craft beer. We didn't really talk about the hip-hop. We did on the behind-the-scenes stuff, but, like, that's an interesting thing to talk about, whether people would be interested in that. Having the hip hop in the, you're talking about busting a Wu Tang in the. Uh, yeah, no, well, we're in the pretty much in the, in the chicken shop. We're all, I won't say all rap all the time, but we're most rap from at least five o'clock on every night. Um, generally, like late '90s, early 2000s rap, the stuff that we grew up every listening night? to. Every night. Yeah. Um, Andrew likes a little bit more of the classic '90s alternative, classic rock stuff. So during the week, Sunday, Mondays, that kind of stuff on his days when he's there, that's what he plays. I play a little bit more rap on my days. Today we were listening to James Brown all day just because it felt like it Shit, when I walked in the whatever, door. Like, whatever. So how does the chicken place even work? You just walk in there, it's like more of a to-go place, and then you have a couple seats? Or we got 60 seats, seats, so you walk up to the counter, place your order off the menu on the wall, um, pick your beer or your iced tea or lemonade or your bourbon, and then sit down, and we do everything from there. It's full service from the minute you sit down. We'll drop your food off, check on you, get you another drink, whatever you need, but we just make it so that everybody orders at the counter. Kills us to control the speed a little bit, allows us to. I to like that though, man. That's a keep, good feel. Keep the vibe the way we want. Like, we wanted to go after that old school check and check feeling. Like, if you ever go down and 
to Nashville or to Memphis that you get where you walk up to the counter and order it and then they take care of it from there. It's probably easier to, it's easier to, to, uh, counter to, service to serve, to, to serve right. because the thing is you don't have people sitting at a table going yep. like, nobody's serving me. Yep. Yep. And getting all upset because you don't miss you get everybody anybody. that comes and then in you and just you have control to serve, every customer that you comes just in. have to take care of the people that are eating and you take yep. care of them all as a whole and be like, Oh, that guy's done. I'll take his food. Did you guys need another drink or yep. anything? Like we do everything as team service. So there's no sections. There's no real positions, that kind of stuff. Everybody just takes care of making sure that the guests get what they need and everybody pulls their tips at the end and every shift is worth exactly what every other shift is worth. I think, I think Matt Phillips, I think his restaurant does the best job in Edmonton of staying true to, you know, you know, you were talking about the Simpsons thing. I don't know if that was on the live or on here. I think ever. it was on the behind the scenes. Yeah. But you're talking about the Simpsons thing. Most other restaurants, they'd, they'd, they'd be like, okay, yeah, sorry. I'm so sorry. But like, you're just like, no, we play Simpsons here. Well, you, you can only do that because own. you're the owner. Like, if, yeah. like the same thing, like, uh, yeah, we get that when you're, freedom when, because that's the one thing that you, that's really cool. And you don't see that very often where the owner's actually in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Most owners are just basically like they, they're Under investors. Are there. Well, I know a decent amount of owners that are in the restaurant all the time. Like that basically running the restaurant? Yeah. There's a lot of them. Yeah, any, lots of small businesses lots are like them. that. Pretty much all of them are. Most yeah. independents. We're just a little bit more willing to take the shit and I like realize that, that we're going to lose a percentage of the population. It won't. You know but, what, though? You know what, though, man? If you, if you stand your ground and you be like, you know what? This it's is not, what we do. This is what we do. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just like, you can't please everyone. I'm just like, a lot of people do like it. I'm we have a like, bunch of people that complain about rap and then get their food to go afterwards. Yeah. yeah. But they, they still like come the in food. They the like food. the food so much. They, like they the just food. don't want to sit there that's and so rap. Or they like don't want to sit so there much. and watch like, we were playing Bad Boys or Boys in the, or Boys in the Hood Serious? on the TV last, or on Ricky. Saturday night. We ran through a bunch of just classic gangster movies. We played Scarface. Like People didn't like it. They like the food, so they're going to take it to go. What that's do you mean they didn't like it? That's so dope. Like, what other restaurants play in that? That's the one thing that is true. Like, if, you're, if your product is good, you don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. You don't have to dress fancy. You just you try to, to get anything. it as, you just say, hey, you want the product. As high quality a product you as we be, can and provide the service that people expect. You can be like the soup Nazi. Just be no us. No chicken for you. <laughs> just be us. And like, no fries, <laughs> no wine. Yeah, that's a wild thing, no fries. Wrap, just us what we want to do what we want to eat what we want to drink how we want to serve people and people seem to really like it and i think it's because we're behind the no 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 we're super personable and we try to be the best people we can to everybody that comes in the door we just have a set set of rules but dude i love it you, know, you don't want a place that does everything for everyone like those places suck yeah they suck yeah that's what was, was, I'm, I'm scrolling through rolodexes in my head of things that like places that do everything for everybody i'm like there's no flavor to them it's just they're like blah you know like they're not i don't know he has a really dope spot and i'm like super stoked on it and all uh, your great brands in history have done something and done it really really well yeah or a few things but done them really really well like you know, great shoe companies, All of them, great yeah, car I was just companies, this, like, great, like, they don't make 200 different types of cars, at least the really great cars make like nine, yeah, 10 or whatever. And that's, they know what they do and they do it really, really well. well. That's the whole thing. Yeah. You have to stick to your niche and then do like one or two things like really, really well instead of doing like 10 or 13 things like half ass. All of us can think of a restaurant with 80, 75 items on the menu. That's too many. Is any of them really very good when you're doing that? Much? Not only that, but you don't even know what. Or to, we do seven. You don't even know what to choose anymore. Yeah. Like you just like. There's, well. There was one which was wild. There's a place called Jimmy's in Saint Albert. It's done now. The the guy actually retired, sold it, retired, left. Uh, Lebanese fellow, him and his wife. They were there since I was a kid. You can order a pizza there. You can order breakfast there. You can order a six steak. You can order fried chicken. Like the whole thing was like, the menu was like everything, but it was like so weirdly good. How do you like, but then when you have a menu like that, how do you keep the food fresh? Because right. it's fucking impossible because you don't know what you're selling. Right. You know, if you got chicken, I don't know, it, was all, it was out of control. Like, I didn't know how they're doing it. You know what it. I'm so saying? Like have, if you have chicken, you're going through chicken. With like every side and time. every variation of chicken we have, we have 17 items on our menu. Yeah. So we prep 17 items. We prep a fuck ton of those 17 items every day. But we prep only those 17 items. Yeah. And our waste is almost nothing. Yeah. Because there's just no time for something to go bad because we only have such a limited menu that it's just like, okay, hey, Like, yeah, sell, it's sell, fucking sell, gone. Sell, like, if sell. something only sells, like you said, three times in a week, that yep. shit's going bad. So you may have bought 10 items for the week and now all of a sudden you have to throw away seven of them. Yep. Then that's, that's how restaurants fail. 
That's a that's a tough that's a tough thing with restaurants. The hard part with restaurants are that other other industries like things go out of style. Like let's say you own a clothing store. Okay, you're in a different season. Oh crap! I can't sell these coats but, because it's summertime now. But you have blowout sales and you sell them at a discount. You can't sell. Hey, you know what? This chicken's <laughs> this only chicken's about three <laughs> weeks old. We'll give it to you for about half off. <laughs> like it doesn't work like that. Try the well, fish. Yeah, try. <laughs> yeah. I'm never going to Northern Chicken and ordering the fish, man. I'm not doing that. <laughs> XR fish dish is pretty awesome. You have a fish dish there? Yeah, we got catfish po' boy. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. But yeah, like, I don't know. I think specialization is the key to business. Like, know what you're going to do. Do it really well. And just focus on that. Yeah, that's... That's a great jewel, that's, man. That's the thing, too, like we started doing. We were, we were spread out. Like, we still can do lots of things, but yep. we, we, like, really been focusing on, like the things that we're selling i'm like okay these things are selling and we know what they're selling for okay let's just push those and then get that like set up like smooth sailing because we know what people want we just give them that and stop trying to like spend time over here where we don't even know and then people ask you for certain things and you're like fuck i can do it but i'm not even you're just throwing a wrench in my system because like now i gotta fucking but then you can make it so it's worth your while to do it yeah, because you can like, systemize it way smoother. Andrew and I and the rest of the cooks, we're still all former fine dining cooks. Like, we still know how to cook a steak. We yeah. can. We just choose not to. So if somebody <laughs> really wants Northern Chicken to cook you a steak dinner, we can do it. You're just going to pay for it. Yeah. yeah. I think that works in all sorts of industries. Like, I'm sure you can still do any of the things that you used I to do. I can do all the stuff. It's just, uh, you but just if somebody wants way them, more money to do just, it. They pay the premium for yeah. it. Yeah. And then you get to keep working on what you're killing, which makes everybody happy. Yeah, that's true. I like that specialization in business. That's a great. Um, well, that's the, that's like the nugget. That's like a and finding that that's, specialization. Yeah. is like that's figuring the, out the hard thing. Yeah, is. you you fell into a cool little niche. Yeah, and it's sort of weird because we did it at a time when like five other fried chicken places were opening, and we didn't know that Soul Fried was going to open a month and a half, like before we started our first pop up. Soul Fried came out of the blue and just opened up. And Popeyes came to town literally the week we opened. I remember that. Which could have been the best thing that ever happened to us. Why? Popeyes opening at the same time. Is they because it did, is that because that created a craze for fried chicken and controversy and controversy. People were all like, "Well, there's this chain." And then you had all the local people that were like, "No, let's support that local." Chain, and didn't it built that chain that, like just have like a freaking crazy lineup on it because it was a chain. Yeah. Lineup out the door, yeah. And line up the corner. The door and then people started open. comparing them, and then everybody was doing their chicken off, and <laughs> then all the news places were doing them, and we ended up winning because we had a better product. Popeyes still around though. Yeah, oh, didn't yeah. go under. They just they just opened their ninth store. Oh. In Edmonton? Eighth? They have eight stores in Edmonton? And they oh, just, they're just franchising the hell out of them, right? Like, how, how do you maintain seven. quality in that point? I don't know point? if they're franchised. Oh, yeah, it's all franchised. It's, franchised. It's, a, it's a couple different owners. but yeah. Yeah, Like, how do you maintain quality at that point? Well, that's our big struggle. That's why we're only one right now. Yeah. how do we build Northern Chicken without Matt and Andrew? Yeah, because I'm thinking to myself, as soon as, you start, so tough. as soon as you start scaling it at that level, then all of a sudden you can't control how well... Like, cause what yeah, they do, they do big corporations and restaurants are like this with their shit. Like everything's like, like it's, 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 it's spec. You, you have it's like everything spec, working like, for Joey's. But what I'm like saying is, is that spec. when you're buying in a franchise like that, you're not, you like, you, you run the spec, but you're more interested in running the system and trying to get money. It's not about, it's not about the quality of chicken. It's like what sells in terms of chicken. Nope. So like, it's about the quality of the chicken. They don't want to push a shitty product. There's a, there's a there's a there's a there's a line but between what I'm is quality that, and quantity in a restaurant. But what I'm saying is is that like uh, if they have a specific recipe and they can buy the chicken for let's say I don't know the numbers but let's say twenty dollars and they get the you know the quality chicken they have or you can get a restaurant like yours who can be like you know what I want to increase the quality I'm going to spend twenty five dollars and get a better chicken you know and then run run the thing you, you kind of like you are you get a higher quality chicken but not necessarily a bigger return yep. right so like a lot of those guys run run more in the return because they're more focusing on the numbers yeah, when you buy a franchise you're more about the numbers than you are about like yep. creating good quality I, I that's just me and the way I see it that's why these smaller little boutiques are always like the smaller boutiques always seem to have better stuff they're just a little bit more expensive but their stuff is much better because there's more love and, and, and that's what you hope is that people are willing to pay for that extra love yeah and the extra technique and the fact that we know where our chickens from and yeah, that we it. hand cut everything that comes in the door and that kind of stuff is, uh, is better better could be subjective too on a devil's advocate does mcdonald's make a bad product 
I can't. I, I, I don't want to throw them under the bus, but I get sick every time I eat McDonald's five minutes after. Mc, the McDonald's, yeah, I, I could argue that they make a great product because they do exactly what they do the best, which is put they on have a hamburger a, they in have two a, seconds. They have a consistent product, and they have a consistent product. And if you have McDonald's in in Edmonton, you'd get the same McDonald's in Calgary and the same McDonald's. That I can agree. Like, it's consistent in every single, single thing. That's how they maintain quality. Yeah. I don't know if I'm... It's yeah. just where that level It's just where that level of quality I guess, is. I guess the level of quality We're you can having get that for, conversation for, all over the place with beer like right a, now. A with beer? $1.50 yeah. burger. How so? Well, is local beer better than Budweiser or Coors? Ooh. Argumentatively. That's tough. Yes, it's a better product. Yes, it is. It yeah. has way more flavor. It tastes better. People love their Budweiser, though. But like, they go crazy And they're for consistent. And you can get Budweiser in the States, and it's exactly the same as you no. can get Budweiser in... Well, they're, in another they're, they're, state, they're if alcohol, you go... Their alcohol level is much lower in the states. It depends on which state you're in, but there's only two states in the states that change the alcohol level compared to any other states. Okay. So if you get a Budweiser in California and you get a Budweiser in Milwaukee, it's pretty close. Yeah. And they should theoretically be that. So Because the recipe is exactly the same. And they do quality control and they dump and they have tasting panels and all that kind of stuff. And like, we're an all craft place. We have zero macro beer on our list. Mm-hmm. For a reason, because we want to support Alberta and we want to support people doing cool things. Yeah. But I often have trouble like slagging those guys because they can make it 150 times in a row and it's exactly the same and it's exactly what Joe Blow is looking for in that moment. Which guys? Well, like Budweiser or yeah, 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 or Coors or Molson. Like, yeah, that's not what I want to drink. But is it wrong in that moment when you do want to drink it? Like, can I come down on that somebody's head for not drinking it? I can provide a better product that's local. I can hope that you're going to buy it. Yeah. But I can't really judge you. No, that's true. I'd like to. <laughs> but can. like the more I think about it, the more I'm just like, I can't really judge. Like everybody's taste is so subjective. And if that's exactly what you want in that moment, then that's what you want in that moment. I was with a Scotch rep a while ago um, and we were talking, we had Lefroy actually out and we were talking about... Uh, how to drink scotch and the guys the, he just I, you probably know what i'm going to say but he's everyone wants their scotch differently yep. right and he's like the best way to drink a scotch is however you want to drink a scotch that's he says that's the best way to drink because people are like oh you put in two ice cubes no it's one ice cube oh you put a drop of water Single in yours gross water. oh yep. you do this ooh, ooh, ooh. it's like that's how the person likes to drink it but there's sometimes where people like they put scotch in like pepsi or scotch and coke and you're just kind of like that's dumb you're like <laughs> like what yeah, like, and I had a Hennessy and Hennessy and Coke, and you're like, it's not, it's cognac. Like, why, why are you putting Coke in it? But like, you can't judge them for it. But at yep. the same time, it's like, yo, bro, like the fuck you. Those are people that are just. Do you want to just sugar, buy like man. a twenty dollar cheaper drink? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's just a whiskey in there or something. Yeah. Like we do all our whiskey at the same price. You do all our whiskey seven fifty. I didn't know that. So whether it's normally an eighteen dollar dram or normally a six dollar dram, everything's seven fifty. And you have really cool bourbon there too. Yeah. So all our bourbons that, with the exception of three of them, which are super high end stuff, and we sell those at fifteen an ounce. But those are still normally like thirty two, thirty three on most other menus. So you're still getting a deal. Yeah. But every time somebody buys like a real good bourbon and drops it into lemonade or drops it into, you're coke, like, I'm just like, oh, you cringe a little bit. You like, cringe a little bit. Why don't you just like, why don't you just drink Jim Beam? Yeah. Why don't yeah. you just drink Jim White, which is perfect for mixing, like. Dude, Beam and Coke's good. I like that's like why you put this one in there. You don't need to drink Baker's and Coke or something like that. Like, <laughs> but who am I to tell them? But who am I? Who are we to right. say that's not what you should drink? That's so funny, man. That's not who I should be or what, what I should be doing. Uh, that's so. a slippery slope to go down when you judge people on what they're eating. Well, like, like when like, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you're judging them on like what they're pairing things with and whatnot. Because you just become people become assholes about it. But yeah, like you're not gonna take a really expensive bourbon and put it in coke. But you hope not. You can. And some people do. Some people do, and that's what some they people like. like it. They they like their like I don't know what is it a coke and uh, a coke and whiskey. Or there's there's people and that like just make it an expensive coke yeah. and whiskey. They just like it like I want something really strong and tasty and. Yeah. Or they don't yeah. even know what they're doing. They just like they'll be like, I'll get the most expensive drink and just just because it's expensive and I'm holding this cup that's twenty five bucks and everyone else has the five dollar one. You know like. There's people that do that type of shit. So it's kind of funny, actually. We see it with beer all the time. Guys Where? come in and buy the $22, $23 beers that we have on our menu, and they're like, you're not going to like this. Yeah. And then they don't. It's like some or they sa- do. It's like a sour or something. Or, or like a 
most of the $25 ones are like Imperial Stouts or Porters. So they're 12 or 13 percent and they're super, super strong and super, super dark and great beer. But yeah. like most of those beers, you got to drink a lot of beer to like them. To like, like them, yeah. You got to have a bit of a palate to get to that. You know, guys that come in and just, oh, it's a $30 beer. I'll buy that. That's, I want to look like a big wig. And then and they get they it and they're like, like <laughs> <laughs> beer gets weird like that. High end beer gets kind of wild. Beer's getting, um, those, uh, those craft beers are really taking off. Uh, you see a lot of restaurants. You see a lot of restaurants. 102 craft breweries in Alberta. 102. Yeah. yeah, I remember when Yellowhead was pretty much one of the only ones. Yellowhead, Wild Rose, Big Rock. Big Rock, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah Big yeah, Rock's a big one. you also have that other that one on, uh, what's the name of that brewery on White Ave? That's big situation. Thing. Situation, too. They got a But they don't, they only talking way before. Ago, They're only like, open two years ago. A couple years ago, there was pretty much it was Alley Cat, it now. was Alley Cat, Big Rock, and Tool Shed for a long time. Yeah. And then Yellowhead opened, and then there was some other ones that came in that sort of first wave of like 2013 well, yeah. and, and, and then they Cal- changed the law in 2015 to reduce 14 to reduce minimum amounts that a brewery could produce and still be a brewery. And all of a sudden, everybody opened. In yeah. Calgary, like, I what think you, there's you, 47 you, breweries in Calgary. They so they used to have a minimum hectoliter law in Alberta. So to sell beer on the market, you needed to produce a certain amount of beer. Yeah. You need to pr- produce, I think it was 10,000 hectoliters. Oh, and so they, so they reduced they reduced the, the mandatory minimum so that you could... There's barriers like, to entry. Cam could, Cam could go... Make some in his basement. Well, and now he can technically... Not, not in your basement, basement. You, but Cam could open a nano brewery, which, like, the guys at Odd... Odd like company that are opening. Cases a yeah, they're they're like only that. gonna. I think they're only three tanks. Like they're gonna produce like three thousand liters of beer. Not a lot. Which is an, a tremendous amount of beer. Like lots of places have tanks that are bigger than that. Yeah. Um, so there's all these little nano breweries that are popping up now that are just doing their tap room or just doing their little community. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Which is kind of dope, actually. They do that. That that type of thing is big in Italy for wine. Yeah. You have all your yeah. regions, but then you got like homeboy's backyard yeah. versus this guy's backyard. Yeah. All sorts of all over Germany cool. and stuff for beer. I don't even know why it's they like, would like, like, they shouldn't even have restrictions on that. They shouldn't have for years. But no. it just, just like, because now you can't get people to get into the fucking market. Yeah. Vodka's, that's why vodka's it took, like that. That's why it took so long for Alberta to catch up. And then you've seen since that happened, how many breweries and distilleries have opened. Because yeah, we grow the best barley. We grow bro. the best barley in the world. Everybody that makes beer buys our malt. All over the states, all the great craft beer places, all the great great distilling districts are all over the world. They buy Alberta malt. Yeah. But we've never actually been able to produce the beer here. And then that happened, and now it's just going crazy. And some of the beer that's coming out right now is rivaling stuff anywhere else in the world. Jeez. Like when Greg's stuff at the Monolith comes out, it's going to rival Belgium for sure. Serious? Yeah. Wild. Dude, yeah, you're a big beer guy. That's, I didn't realize yeah, that. That's most of my life now is, is craft beer and judging beer and... <laughs> judging beer. How did that, yeah, like how did I, that I just did the Alberta Beer Awards. I was one of the judges at that. So I was one of 30 guys that went down to Lacombe for the weekend and we drank almost everything in Alberta. Picked 23 winners. Went from there. So. Is this just like a passion thing now? Well, we've just, yeah, we've just always like, we wanted to have great beer and I've always wanted to drink great beer. Like I never was the Canadian or the Kokanee guy after like 21, maybe 22. I discovered Sherbrooke Liquor Store and I've been buying... Yo, I love Sherbrooke. Imbo- importer craft beer since I was 21. Yeah. Um, Sherbrooke, Sherbrooke is the uh, is the one on... Uh, 118th and 137th. 118. Traffic circle. The, the traffic lights. circle. Yeah. Every beer like legally available in Alberta, beer. pretty much. Yeah. So I just, when we opened Northern, it was... We wanted to do craft beer and craft only, and we wanted to serve good beer. And uh, it just sort of grew from that, that I started hanging out with the people in the industry. And it's just this industry that's unlike any other one I've ever been in where it's not competition. Everyone sort of realizes that the rising tide's gonna float everybody. If they can convert five people a day to drink craft beer instead of Budweiser or Canadian, that's a win for all craft beer. So it's this community of people that just like each other and hang out and like they all go for, all the beer reps go for breakfast every Friday morning and just talk about their lives and. There's a whole little community. Yeah, it's crazy. How's that? Uh, Arcadia, if you ever want to like go experience a little bit, there's a bar on 124th called Arcadia and like you walk in there and almost everybody it's in beer, like all the brewers in the city, all the reps, that kind of stuff are going to be in there on any given night and they all know each other and they all hang out and it's just like, it's the coolest little community I've ever seen, especially coming out of restaurants where it was like, competition, fuck fuck you, you, I'm better than you, like (laughs) everybody has an ego, like like, chefs chefs are all macho and that kind of stuff, whereas brewers, it's like, I'm going to go make a beer with 
that guy tomorrow and we're going to release it together. Like they do everything is like collaboration. Yeah, right? everything's collabs. That's everybody's is, drinking man. everybody else's stuff. Everybody's talking, you know, it's maybe a little bit of shit about somebody's product, but most of it's like it's that whole you talk shit in private. You don't talk shit. Good. Talk shit in person. And like, it's just such a super cool community, and I just sort of fell in love with it. I've always liked beer, so to progress it from a hobby to actually taking it seriously and learning how to judge it and learning what makes the difference between everything has just been a really cool little year and a half project and. It shows in the fact that we just got ranked one of the best beer lists in Alberta, and that's dope, man. It's been fun. Like I got to judge the Alberta Beer Awards twice. Get to go do some other judging stuff later this year, which is just super cool and is there a, interesting. Is there a schooling for that? Because with wine sommelier level it's one, a BJCP, cool the yeah. Beer Judge Certification Protocol, um, and then there's also something called Cicerone. One's on one side of the one's on like the service side of things. How to properly I, serve a beer? Yeah, because there's many different ways, many different glasses. Yeah, and just, important things around how clean everything is, how it's served, what you should be recommending. Sort of the small A side of things is more the Cicerone and then Kay. the BJCP is like how to judge it, how to brew it. How to judge it? Yeah. Is so the proper like, way to drink? A it's 123. No, I'm wrong on that. There's a certain amount of styles and every one of them has very specific points that it needs to be brewed yeah. to. And most people don't brew to style anymore. Like... Well, a lager has to have exactly certain points on it. It has to be an exact amount of IBUs. It needs to be that. And most people don't brew exactly to those spec specifications anymore, but there's a full-on protocol on how you're supposed to judge beer. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty intense. Like between a nine and a 10-month course to get through it, most people fail. You get to pass a 200-question exam plus design a beer and you've, have you plus done this? blind judge. No, I'm in the middle of it. You what? I'm in the middle of it. You're in the middle of it. I'm four months in. I probably, based on my work schedule, I probably have a year and a half left. And then you have to take your test. Yeah, and then I have to do all the blind judging and stuff. Yeah. So then the blind judging, that's wild, dude. And then you, and then they're going to be like, what type of beer is this? What are the IBUs? What's this? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? Damn. What's the what's the flaw in this beer? And they'll intentionally flaw beers and put them in front of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll give you a lager and add too much hops to it or something or like whatever it is. Yeah. Dude. So it's been a good process, you know? Definitely changes how you drink too, because it's no longer like the amount of beer I dump now. Because, because you're just like, like this it. is gross. Yeah, I just mm. you know this wasn't a great example of this style, so I'm gonna dump it rather than just like whatever. Fuck it. That's alcohol fuck it. abuse. I'm gonna fucking drink this beer because I cracked it, and I'm gonna chug it. Like you actually think about what you're drinking, and you're sort of drinking for intention rather than drinking to escape from stuff. Ooh, that's deep. Ooh. And you're drinking to think about it. I, I definitely, like, after a hard day, we'll just sit down and pound a beer, too. But, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, you drink because you want to understand the science behind why people do things or why they got these flavors or, like, why this IPA tastes like mango when there's no mango in it. That's it's wild. super, super cool. And it's an experience that, like, you know, even if you could get a couple percent of the population to start understanding that, it would be super cool for people's heads because it's fucking weird. I love it. I love it with wine. Wine, yep. like I really like. I can't drink like low level wine. Like I'm not a snob or anything. But like once you have like a really nice stuff and you go down here, you're like, how are these people drinking this shit? It's yep. gross. Like it's like tastes terrible. Is uh, same thing with the beer. Yep. How do you get notes of blackberry or notes of anise out of a wine? Right? There's no fennel in it. There's no yeah, blackberries in it. It's just how you process those grapes and what you fermented and what your soil's like. Yeah, yeah. The the agriculture, the weather, the how much heat, moisture. There's so much stuff that goes into mm -hmm. it. Same thing with exactly beer, the I guess. Same with beer. Yeah. That happens. You look at hops, there's hundreds of different types of hops. Yeah. Each one of those has a different flavor. What's profile. your what's your take on um I was just at what where, where was I? I was at uh little microbrewery St. Albert. Endeavor? Uh no. Um they, they call the guy Santa Claus. Beer hunter? No, 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 no. Ah, uh, for how am I bumbling the name? Anyways, he's ta he was talking about uh, uh, cannabis infused beer. Do you have a take on that at all? It's or? gonna come. Yeah. Collective Arts out of Hamilton just signed uh, a huge contract. Can you do that though? Like, can you actually? Because now you're mixing. Because they talk See, about mixing in alcohol and that's gonna two be different the drugs. That's that gonna be the problem, man. You it's can't not gonna it. be cannabis beer. It's gonna be cannabis beverages. Yeah. That's yeah, okay, thing. beverage. Yeah, because... There's well, cannabis beer floating around all over the place. Yeah, Lots of brewers make it. Because that just, was the it's same... It's not legally yeah. available. That it's was the same, same way that any edible right problem you had where you couldn't like. actually mix Red Bull with, uh, yeah. with alcohol. Like, that's illegal. And that's why they would always sell it to you separately. Yeah. And you were always supposed to mix it yourself. Yeah, but you had Four loco, Which took four? a long time to get into Canada. What's Four loco? 
These people died drinking it. I have one. We have one at the house. That yellow can that I have, it's an original Four Loko. You you drink that, it'd probably kill you. Right it's now. crazy yeah. high caffeine, cheap alcohol, like NDS. Yeah, yeah. Four Loko, there's a lot of dudes in the States. They uh, for, You know what that means? It's for crazies. Yeah. For crazy, yeah. <laughs> well, four, four, four crazies. It's, no, it's, I know, it's but it's local it, with a K. It's not L O C O, L O K O. Anyways, um, the guy uh, in the states, a lot of those dudes do those like those frat parties. A lot of these guys were uh, in the hazing. They they make them drink a crazy amount of booze. But they were they were making these kids shotgun these these four yeah. locos. And a lot of kids had heart attacks and, and died. Okay, yeah. I've I just heard. Now this is gonna sound. Like, effed up. I didn't even know this was a fucking thing in California. Did you know that they're doing a thing called butt chugging in yeah, California? I've heard about that. Dude, that's Steve-O, man. Steve-O like, started the butt chug. I'm like, what the fuck is that? I'm just like... You never done a butt chug? Okay, keep, keep explaining, because... Yeah, yeah, keep going. No, you tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me your experience with a butt chug. <laughs> if, you, if you've done a butt chug, tell us this experience. What's that experience like, Cam? <laughs> Nothing happened with the butt chug. It does. You said you like you asked me if I've done it. You obviously have done it. Let's see. Let's hear. I've never. Experience. I've never done a butt chug before. I'm just gonna keep keep explaining <laughs> what happened with the butt chug, man. So this guy's explaining like it's literally like funneling. Like yeah. when we were kids, you used to funnel, and you said, except they stick the shit up their yeah. ass. And I'm just like, what the fuck is? This I've heard about it. I don't know actually know anybody that's admitted to doing it, but that's. That I've never is, done a butt chug. That though. is fucking nuts that I'm just like, I didn't even know that was a thing. For the record, I've never done a butt chug. That's good. I'm and glad. that's I'm, um, ha- I'm happy to hear record, that. Record, no butt chug. No that, butt chugs. No butt chugs. That Steve O did that. Yeah. Not me, Steve O. He's talking about fucking Steve O. Steve O. Jackass. Jackass. Like, like, hey guys, today we're doing and the butt chug. There's aerosolized alcohols now floating around the United States. That, Aerosol? Yeah. So you inhale them. It bypasses your uh, bypasses your liver too. What yeah. The fuck so it fucks you up way way faster. You can do that with you can do that in your house with a two liter pop bottle. You can you can uh, vaporize the alcohol and then just chug beer without actually drinking it. Oh, I actually want to do it. I'm gonna try it. Oh my god. Matt Phillips, I'm gonna do that. And I'm I gonna, think that I'm gonna scares t- me. I'm gonna tell <laughs> you my experience. He tell you, <laughs> you can crazy, inhale the alcohol. You're doing crazy ass experiments, man. It's like you're not, <laughs> it's crazy. Man. It's a crazy experiment. Yeah, but are they? Is that legal? Can you? I don't know. I've seen it on Instagram, but I don't know if it actually. It's like went a, it's a legit thing, hey? Yeah, that's some shit that'll mess you up. Yeah. Steve-O did some crazy shit. He put a he put a, a shot of vodka in an IV, and he just chugged the vodka right to his bloodstream. <laughs> What's wrong with this guy? Like, these are the type of shit. I'm just like, what is happening to society that this is the dude? Type come of shit on, are dude. Doing? Jackass was another level, man. I Jackass was watch, sick. I couldn't watch that show, man. It was just some of the stuff they were doing. I was getting disgusted on. Dude, that was, was the like, first. Cool. The first CKY was good. Can I kill yourself? That shit. After so that, dope. it just sort of like they went so far over the line with some of it that I just couldn't watch it. The guys got getting stapled and shit. And just, oh. <laughs> getting his ass stapled together, <laughs> dude. Yeah, well, the first, well, the first CKY the was just like stunts and yeah. like in like their they shopping rent, carts. They would rent a car and not get the oh, insurance and then fucking destroy it. <laughs> fucking the best part of CKY too. <laughs> is when he totally trashed that car and sent it back. <laughs> well, it cost us was eight bucks for extra insurance. <laughs> and then there's a blow up doll in it too, wasn't there? Uh, they would kick the football into the guys yeah. that they were driving by. Oh yeah, like, drive it by. They'd punt the football like like so ignorantly, like like ten feet away from the road. You just punt the ball. Just have the little kid there be like, <laughs> weren't they? Yeah, weren't they chucking? They were chucking mannequins off the off the, off the the, the <laughs> freaking bridge in front of cars. Like, that one got them in a bunch of trouble. Yeah, you can't do that. Man. <laughs> Putting other people's lives at risk. That one got them in a bunch. Of my shit. my church bus driver actually died like that. What? Like someone threw a pumpkin at him and it killed him. <laughs> like, oh, how man. fucked is that? Yeah, on the white mud. That's crazy. Yeah, someone someone cut. Uh, like the actually there wasn't there wasn't a thing. There was a uh, over the white mud. There's like down by like 178th Street and stuff there's like that. Banisters and stuff. Yeah, there's no no. There's the, the you can walk over it. The pedestrian bridge. Right, the pedestrian bridge, right? Yeah. So someone thought it'd be a funny idea to chuck a pumpkin at a car, except it, at 80 kilometers an hour, it took the guy's head off. Like it it replaced his head yeah. with a pumpkin. Like you took a pumpkin at 80k, oh. <laughs> like, but it fi- oh. freaking finished. This what, was the pastor stupid... at your church? No, no, he's the bus driver for the oh. youth. I don't. I'm not. I'm not laughing that he died. It sounds so terrible. But you're like, horrible. <laughs> just, what a stupid ass way to go out. How do you yeah. explain that to funeral? Like uh, James was a really nice man. Oh. It's just so stupid that it happened. Yeah, what a stupid way. But it's stuff like that. You're just like, that was just 
divine like how does that happen like that's just too many things just lined up that it was just fucking kids perfect just stupid shit. yeah what what went through the kid's head that day to be like you, you know, know what james i'm gonna or you know, steve i'm gonna throw a pumpkin you know off what? this bridge I, sometimes sometimes like i think like when that when shit like that happens something takes over those people because it's happened so perfectly it's happened to me sometimes where i've been no nothing's taken over anymore. no no no, no, no. kids chucking like, pumpkins off roofs i know all I know. of us have done stupid I've shit done i know that i know you i bet you have i know but like sometimes when you do some stupid shit and it like it's fucking perfect yeah. you know like you're just like how did that go perfectly like one time i took a slap shot in hockey not aiming but it was perfectly ding the guy right in the head and i'm like I couldn't fucking plan that. Yeah. Like I wasn't aiming for his head, but it was just like it was like a perfect shot. And Steve, just, can, like at that point, you're just like, how did that happen? Can you uh, can you explain to us your hockey experience here in Edmonton real quick? Or? <laughs> no, I can't. I can't. <laughs> you I can't I, talk on it. <laughs> well, I can, I have trouble playing hockey because I lose control. I lose control. Like it's the one it's the one sport that I basically like. Um, and I played rec hockey. I've been kicked out of a few rec hockey leagues. Holy crap! Yeah. How did you get kicked out of <laughs> Get a I, got kicked out, I got kicked out in Toronto too. I got kicked out of the Rec Hockey League and I got kicked out of this Rec Hockey League. The problem with the Rec Hockey League is that like in normal hockey, he I had, starts it fighting was, motherfuckers. <laughs> he starts sucker punching like people. Like Beer League? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Oh, I just find it so funny you get so, kicked out of hockey. So what hockey. happens is in regular hockey, like I was, I was a goon, so it was easy. Like if you, if if all those emotions rise up and it takes over, I can actually like play legally and yeah. I can hurt people legally. Like yeah. I could just I could just hold it in, line the guy up and catch him, and then beer league hockey you can't you can't check. Hockey, There's no so for checking hockey, or back and checking. It's worse because what happens is that you're playing and then the guys are just like hacking and slashing and hacking and slashing and. My, my my tolerance level goes goes like this goes like this and I always start yelling at the ref first. And then he top or two. And then when somebody. I start and then when I start yelling at the refs, <laughs> the refs don't like being yelled at. Yeah. Cause I'm yelling at them, make a call, make a call. As I'm, as no I'm call. skating, yeah, cause it's cause it's midnight on the shitty ice time. Like playing, they're not making no call. Cause I'm playing with the puck, I'm skating, and all these guys are just hooking and slashing, and I'm just like, make this call already, man. I'm just like, and then they don't make the call, and eventually I lose puck, and I turn around, and I end up socking some guy in the face or cross checking someone <laughs> and getting really mad and getting in fights. Oh, the last time dude. I punched some guy on the bench. <laughs> Yeah, this guy, this guy nailed the dude on the bench for laughing at him. Because the girl, there was a girl on her on their team, and the girl was slashing me heavy, like slashing me heavy, and I was so mad that she was slashing me, and they weren't making any calls, and I almost scored. But then the heckling from the bench, because they were laughing at me the whole time. So then I just calmly skated. I I lose control like a complete, and it's literally like it's like a split second. It's just enough time where you're just like, I just like. I don't know what happens. It's just like you make a split second of shit and you punch the guy in the face and you're just like, I should have oh, done fine. that. <laughs> Dude, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah, but we all do dumb things when we're yeah. a kid. I chucked a, chucked a manhole cover off of a bridge over by uh, Sherwood Park one time. A that manhole was cool. cover? That's a little bit worse than a pumpkin, man. Yeah, it didn't kill anyone, though. Like, that's still <laughs> heavy. Well, it was into the river. It was into the oh. river. It made the biggest slap ever. But yeah, I've, I've thrown things off bridges, so. I could see how that would go through your head you wouldn't think it's a bad idea until like it's a bad idea yeah yeah right throwing Especially a pumpkin, with a pumpkin bridge, it's yeah. just like yeah this can be funny yeah. <laughs> it's gonna smash some guy's car and it takes out his whole window <laughs> like oh i yeah. didn't expect that yeah that's probably exactly what it was or that could have happened to me when i chucked a manhole cover yeah. off there could, could have been, been someone something there could have been someone kayaking All of a sudden down a there fucking kayak came underneath the thing like and you hit him right completely out of the blue just <laughs> oh fuck <laughs> It's like that mouse. Do you tell anyone at that point? Like, it's, like the, it's like that mouse. It just oh basically yeah. it was his time. It was his time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You didn't tell him. It was like we were, we were, uh, we were skateboarding or like uh, longboarding. Longboard. We and he's longboard. hanging out and he's, he stopped ahead of me and he stopped and he's on the side of the road. And so like I'm, I'm longboarding past him and he yells at me as I'm longboarding past him. He goes, watch out for the mouse! Because he started running across the road and I literally squished, him, oh. squished the shit out of him. Yeah, you squished the mouse. It was just like it was like it was like this little red streak, and then some fur at the end of this like streak of red. Like he literally ran across. I'm just like, it must have been his time. I, my wheels are like this thick, and he literally caught the first wheel completely. Like not even like just a clipping of him. Like fully caught the wheel. Like oh. literally, he, he wasn't even just there. Vaporized. Yeah. yeah. So hit. I mean, we, we do dumb shit, and yeah. I'm sure the mouse did something. Yeah. I'm like that shit doesn't end. like that was karma hitting him in the ass. <laughs> Because I, 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 I had no control. I was rolling, and I was just an innocent bystander in that moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think? Do you want to wrap this guy up? 
Sure. Sure. Yeah, let's wrap her up. That was good. Man. That was good. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for thanks for joining no us. No problem. And, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah Matt Phillips, uh, can you tell the people, I got a couple good actually pieces of knowledge from you, Thanks. to be completely honest. Um, do you have, where, where can they, the people contact you, where, where um, can they find you? At Chef M. Phillips on Twitter, uh, at Interrupt on Instagram, and I'm at Northern Chicken all the time. So. Can, you, can, you, can you tell us Interrupt? Oh, actually, what is Interrupt? Because uh, so I, I know you to, as Interrupt. I used to play a lot of... How to say this? I used to be a hacker way back in the day. Um, like I, I ran one of the original bulletin boards before the internet was like a big what? thing. I ran a bulletin board service in Olds, Alberta. Me and a couple guys. We were one of three bulletin board services that was connected to a network called FidoNet. FidoNet was sort of the precursor to the internet that was non um, non governmental and non military. Um, so I used to be on those as a guy named Dark Cyber. And we did all sorts of crazy shit, and we were involved in some pretty dumb stuff with Telus at that point, AGT, and some phone system stuff. And this is sick. So you get to le- you get basically get to you, you learned how to yeah how to basically maneuver through yeah the web. and that kind of stuff. People don't know how to maneuver through and the then web. I, like, and I mean, then I got on the internet. My dad was one of the first private internet connections in Alberta because he was a school superintendent. They were trying to demo um, a private internet service in Olds, which then became the first place with fiber optic internet in Canada. Yeah. Um, and I just happened because my dad was an academic and he was the head of the school board. We were the first people at home that got access to all this stuff. Um, so I was on all sorts of platforms like Telnet and FTP and using gopher services and stuff when I was eight, nine and 10 years old. And eventually uh, a platform called MR or IRC came out, which was internet relay chat. And uh, I used to be IRC. Dark Cyber on IRC, and then I got in a fight with a dude. Uh, he wanted that name. Dark Cyber? Yeah. Your name was Dark Cyber? Yeah. And IRC, we went back and forth. Like, yeah. That was a chat. That was the yeah, chat it was a thing. chat. Like so I was on a, like, a, like a MSN, group called, MSN chat. Yeah, it was like was MSN, MSN before MSN. It was before MSN. MSN before MSN. There was AOL right? for a chat, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was way before AOL. Way before, too, before so. man. This is like the original, because I remember my dad used to work for like all, t- all text-based chat with no images and stuff like that. What was it? ICQ? ICQ. I still use ICQ I remember ICQ, yeah. It still, it still works. works. Yeah, I still use it. It's on my phone. ICQ. I have four or five people I still communicate with on a regular basis. With is ICQ. it encrypted? Yeah. It's great. It's still all the same contacts I've had. Like a bunch of guys that I was involved with throwing raves and stuff when I was 14 and 15. Like that's throwing raves? still how we all talk. Damn. It's still through that because that's how we've always had each other's numbers. So we just, like, even though I still see them, they come to the restaurant and I have their cell phone now. It's just, I don't know. There's not nostalgia piece. Do you but they made an app for it? ICQ? Yeah, it's on there. It's got a phone app. That thing's been around for a while. Yeah. Is it like open source code then, eh? I guess so. And it's still from the original ICQ corporation. They still use it. Your yeah. number still works. Like one one six 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 five five three was my login. My password's still exactly the same. And it works. Dude, that's freaking dope. So somebody wanted Dark Cyber as a name on on EFNet, which was one of the like main IRC nodes. And uh, eventually he just sort of took it from me. He jacked you? Yeah. So he waited till I went offline and then he put a bot on with that name. And the way EFNet worked was if you were your name only while you were online. So if you had to disconnect or if way back in the day when you were on telephone systems. Someone could take it. Yeah. So he just put a bot on, which was just, you know, a robot that kept that name. Until I eventually just got tired and I was like Dark Cyber 2 for a while and like... Oh, yeah. Dark Cyber, like C-Y-B-R-E. So and he put the bot on and then basically... Took, took the it. name, so I became Interrupt and I've been Interrupt for since I was 12. That is freaking the, one of the dopest stories. So I've been interrupted. But this is like when like, you were like eight or nine, you're like, had like this. Yeah, I would have been, I guess I would have been 13 when I was interrupted. That's when we started Nexo, which was the bulletin board service. Okay, what's a bulletin board service? So precursor to the internet, you used to have these little local internet systems that would like, you could transfer files back and forth or play online games that were all text-based. Th- those were like the little group chats. Yeah. Is what it was. Like the bulletin boards were like little group chats. Yeah, that except they weren't really into. connected to anything. And then what your computer would do was once a day, it would call into a server. So in olds, it would call into a server in Red Deer. And it would upload. It would update the All thing. the message boards that you were a part of on, okay. your, on your little bulletin board. Yeah. And then you'd, be able to send messages all over the place. Were these messages that. instant or was this like only, it only updated when it hit the server? It only updated server. when it updated and you only had one phone line so only one guy could be on the bulletin board at once. Yeah. 
or if you were big, like we got up to four phone lines. Oh, I remember that too. You used to just basically put, you used to put a note on there and then people would, whoever would went in there get to read the note. Yeah. That's kind of what So we ran a bulletin board called Nixa and then I was involved in a couple other ones. What's were, Nixa? It just, it was our phone number, like 556-NIXA. Oh, is what okay. The, so we called it Nixa and it was our thing. That I was, was like, my whole life up until I was 14 was going computer security wise. I was like 100% in on that's what it was going to be. Through my dad, I got to take some courses at the U of C with the head of computer security, which was the only program in Canada. At How that old point. were you? You were young. 14. And going to UFC courses. Well, we, like he was doing private courses for teenagers in their engineering department talking about it. Because at that point, nobody was really looking at the fact that there was this huge hacker community that was starting to take aim and starting to take down businesses and stuff. But nobody really knew how to take the other side of it. The protection So the UFC side. was the yeah. first, they were the first university in Canada to do a computer security program. It was like white hackers, right? Like and I really, really wanted to take that at 14. And then I realized how much math was involved in computer science. <coughs> and I, you know, started smoking pot, started skateboarding, started throwing raves and going to raves, started wakeboarding and snowboarding. And like eventually just math wasn't my thing. And then just fell out and realized that there was no way I was going to compete with the amount of people that were going into computer science with the grades I was getting. Yeah. So I gave up. I really haven't done anything like that except kept the name in years. Wild. We did some stupid shit. Yeah. Yeah, a lot stupider than throwing pumpkins off bridges or... Yeah, there was all sorts of like these hacker groups in the States, like the Masters of Destruction that started all these wars with people and we'd like... MOD versus LOD was like a four-year war that resulted in a phone system being taken down and that's how the MOD got busted. The Mont? Yeah, Masters of Destruction. Wow. That's the group. Yeah, they were a group of nine guys. It's actually some of the stories that came out like the movie hackers was so incredibly fake and false and stuff but some of those characters are loosely based we're on loosely were based in, off people in mod i've heard of mod before yeah. masters of destruction yeah they did all sorts of really just crazy shit like they took down ma bell like ma bell in okay. chicago ma bell like michigan bell they took down that whole network for a long period of time they were involved in some crazy television hacks like just a really cool sort of period of history that I happen to be really involved in. That's crazy because like I don't really under, like a lot of the majority of people have no idea what what that is. Like I said, like the it's dark, underground, underground. Being able to dark, whistle like, a modem tone, like which one? Like I know guys that used to know guys that could whistle modem tones. Jeez. So you could like whistle into a computer, or like you take a tone dialer, which used to be before touch tone phones were really really prevalent. Radio Shack used to sell these little boxes that had just a touch tone on them. And if you're at your grandma's house and she still had a radio or like a rotary phone and you needed to get into telephone banking or whatever, you'd use the tone dialer to make those tones on the phone and then you could get into whatever. Get her, her info. Well, not her info, but you could just use her phone to make a phone call yeah. using the dialer rather than going... Yeah, okay. If you changed the crystal that was inside a tone dialer up 15 megahertz, suddenly you could make tones that would get you free phone calls. If you put it up to a payphone and hit the star key, you could get unlimited free phone calls from that. Which back when payphones were super like See, big. This is shit if you, I love you, that shit. That There's all sorts so of stuff that you used dope. to be able to do that was super crazy. Because everything was a bit more analog? Yeah. yeah and it was all just based on tones and that kind of stuff. When you dropped a coin into a... Oh, frequencies. When, eh? Yeah. When you dropped a coin into a payphone, it used to make a frequency that would go down the line and unlock the phone. So if is you could mimic that frequency, you could do whatever you that's, wanted. That's how the payphone worked. It used to work, yeah. Can, is that the same frequency you hear when you put the coin in? No, you'd never be able to hear that frequency. No. Well, you could hear it a little bit, but most people's ears. Oh, it's be just able like a it's up. like a high pitch frequency yeah. that just basically resonates and opens up the phone line, right? Yeah. So there's just all sorts of shit and like you know, that. People that, that used that could, to exist. Yeah. Damn. And then most of the guys that I ran with, like all of us, are out of that world now. I think a couple of them ended up being programmers, but most of us got real jobs and Jeez. ended up doing whatever. But that's yeah, where yeah. the name came from. Interrupt. That's and I've cool. I've just been interrupt forever. Do you use any like PGP stuff? Like any really. like pretty good? In, yeah. I don't. My life's an open book. Yeah. Like I'm give so little fucks about privacy. It's almost funny. Okay. Yeah. Fair play. Yeah. 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 Sort of at the point where like so I'm using a Google phone. No, I'm really, you are you, are you just giving in? Like you're like just I, I use it, a like Google phone. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Like. I'm sure that all that information is already taken. So yeah. why fucking? Yeah, they it take now? the. Take I don't do anything illegal. Like, yeah, I don't yeah. need to hide my communication from everybody. I don't really use encrypted communication for anything other than like I know people on those apps, anyways. Yeah. 
I gotta use WhatsApp because I know some people in Europe, but it's the easiest way to talk. It's about. easiest, not because you're like, okay, I don't yeah. want anyone to Nobody catch this other this. day. Like, I don't give a shit. Yeah, and WhatsApp's one of the best. PGP, yeah. like one of the, one of the best ones, which is weird, because you wouldn't think it's being that big and all. But which intra- WhatsApp, WhatsApp, yeah, WhatsApp's one of the best encrypted uh, messaging platforms mm. there is. Way back, I used to use all that kind of stuff, but now, like, I don't know, I put it all out in the world. Yeah. Does MSN even. still kick around, like an MSN chat? I don't think so. No? I know AOL just got disconnected. Like it was within the last year and a half or so that yeah. the last AOL messages were sent, that they finally disconnected that they platform. Finally finished it, yeah. I remember America IRC Online. still exists. Like, there's still all sorts of people that use IRC. Yeah. I just, all the guys that I hung out with on there are now, we text each other or they come to the restaurant. Like That's hilarious, man. That's I'm still really, cool. really good friends with a lot of those guys, though. And they know you as Interrupt. Yeah. That's so sick. And Dark Cyber, that's so cool. Can I start calling you that? I'd be that's like, funny Dark though, Cyber. because like Facebook was the first platform that actually used people's real name. Yeah. Because before that, it was always like a username. Give a username, give me a username. Give, and then Facebook said, give us your name. And then all of a sudden, you started actually using your actual name. And then name. it was like, oh, let's give you everything. Yeah. yeah. Literally give you everything. Everything, they have everything. Yeah. How many, who's, who's my family member? How many dogs I have? What Here's all I the picture of my to? life. This is what I did. You know, it's so funny. It though. pops up and it's like, when it's, did you take this job? I was like, oh, fuck, I'll fill that out. Yeah. <laughs> I've, ever, I've, ever, I've, ever see, I've ever seen the thing is like the, the guy said, I got a great idea for the CIA. We're just going to get the people to just give us the information. I'm like, they know you won't just freely give you the information. Watch. And then like everyone just freely gives up all their information. Oh. And like they have everything about you on there. And they, they, I think it's probably see like how much money you make too. Oh, yeah. Easy. Ask you exactly how much money you make. Oh, it does. Yeah, they do it for marketing. You got it. Because when, when you put an ad up, you can target it to different demographics yeah. with the financial. But it's asking you how much money What's you What's Air Miles for? Like Air Miles, any of those loyalty programs, all they're doing is just tracking all your spending and yeah. tracking your income and all that yeah. kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, because like, everywhere you go, you swipe in Air Miles. They're just like, hey, that, that card's <coughs> like, oh, this person's buying from here, from here, from here. Then here's, they can sell here's that Here's your info. little consumer profile. Yeah, exactly. Dude, that's It'd be crazy. super cool to get in and be able to see some of that kind of shit. Like, that data? What does Facebook have on me? Google opened it up, theoretically, right? You can now go into Google and see all the information that they theoretically have. You're going to see some scary shit. Look back and like... No, you can literally track my phone and see everywhere that I've been because I have location services on. You can yeah. go anywhere and like you can just go into your Google account and click my location and it will show you a map of everywhere you've been. How long you spent there, what restaurant or location was there. And that's, it will ask you to confirm tracking. stuff. Yeah, that's crazy. I don't have the maps on my phone yeah. and stuff like that. I don't do that. And see, I leave all that stuff open because I just... You're, you're kind of whatever at this point. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's fair. Probably shouldn't, but... It is what it is. Yeah. That's well, well, you know what the easy money, thing yeah. is? Uh, yeah. The one thing about that is it's very easy to disappear because you just turn your phone off and disappear, walk away. They'd never find you. That's wild. There's two, there's two sort of, tra- I know we're tra- trying to wrap it up, but there's two sorts of tra- trains of thought with this. Uh, there's people, I was just watching a little documentary on this. There's people who are like, everything's PGP. There's like, they're, they're, they're using PGM, Onion Router. They're on tour. They're doing yeah. all this sort of stuff. And then there's other people that are like, I'll open book. Like there's China, for example, with their social credits, uh, like their thing. That's the wide open book. It's about as open as it gets. Yeah, like literally they can basically like track your face recognition and then all your fucking data shows up through your face recognition on the screen in real time while the actual like security guy. While you're crossing guy, the street or something. While the guy's like crossing the street, the security guys that are monitoring the city, security and city can see your social statings all like all laid out there. Yeah, so there's two of the ways of thinking. It's whatever, I'm not doing anything wrong. They're, what, they're not, all they're doing is checking me out. Then there's the other people that are like, ah, uh, can't, have, can't have anything out. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I don't believe that things are inherently evil Well, no, bad. but And that's just, probably my fault, but like I don't. It's just a matter of like as soon as you want to rebel or something you don't agree with and you try to stand up they have yeah, all the ammunition to basically yep. take you down and that's the scary thing because it's like they'll take you down and they just do what uh, uh, like um, a credit assassination like basically like uh, they basically assassinate your uh, character assassination yep. like what was the name of that be- the the one with Wilson? enemy of the state enemy of the that, state yeah. they just take everything away take away your cards all your money on your cards because there's nothing tangible anymore there's nothing physical so if there's nothing physical, you know, they can take it all away. Yeah. And then like, so you don't have anything anymore, like nothing. You can't even have like a bunch of cash in your pocket and stuff like that because if it's on your card and you go use your card and all of a sudden you're just like, boom, hooped. 
It's done. It's done. So like, but hey, let's end on that. That's oh, well, that's the long, the long version of interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> I never even knew that about you. All right, Northern Chicken, Matt Phillips in the building. Check us out. Where do they find you? Where's the address? So 10704 124th. Open 24th. 11 to 11 on the weekend, 11 to 10 during the week. Northern Hip Chicken. Hip hop, fried chicken, craft beer. Sweet. All right. Thank you. Matt Perfect. Phillips, Thanks appreciate that. Me. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, no Peace. Peace out, guys. See you guys. See you guys next week. Peace. Thank <laughs> you.